Um, before I outline the, event, the agenda for today, uh, I'd like to invite uh, two introductory presentations. Um, and first of all, it's my pleasure to invite Joanne Harmon, chairperson of the QQI board and education manager with the uh, Health and Safety Authority to formally open today's symposium. I'd invite Joanne to uh, give her opening address now. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Peter, and good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm delighted to open this symposium this morning on work-based assessment and delighted to see so many of you and so many registrations for today. Uh, work-based assessment is so important across higher and further education and training. Um, and I think we can agree it's a critical piece of the jigsaw, uh, as we know, and it warrants a good deal of consideration and reflection. So this event today is the work uh, of a joint effort by Quality and Qualifications Ireland QQI and the National Forum for the Enhancement of Teaching and Learning. It's an ongoing collaboration which has proved to be very successful for the past number of years. Firstly, I think we can acknowledge that the workplace can be a superb environment for learning, teaching uh, and assessment. In the workplace, learners can work as trainees um, alongside the kinds of practitioners that they aspire to become. Um, essentially, they can learn from the best. Um, they can also be challenged with real world tasks uh, that must be tackled in real time um, and within realistic contexts. Um, they can also be guided and mentored uh, by wise practitioners. So the whole experience can really grow their confidence and when it's done well, it can deliver a quality learning experience. Unfortunately, these potential benefits aren't automatically realized when a learner is placed in the workplace. Um, to realize the potential of the workplace as a learning environment, I think all involved need to understand the scholarship of work integrated learning and how to apply it to ensure that learners get the most out of their experience. Uh, today's event aims to help advance that understanding in Ireland and will focus on work-based assessment, getting to grips with policies and practices. Work-based assessment involves a wide range of stakeholders, as we know, um, including learners, education providers, employers, workplace mentors and supervisors, professional bodies, occupational associations, trade unions, and regulators of practitioners. Um, it's very important that all of these voices and roles are duly considered and that all of these actors are supported in developing their understanding of the principles of effective uh, work integrated learning. I think one of the many unfortunate impacts of the pandemic um, has been the availability of work placements. Uh, we know they are at a premium in these times. Um, that said, the crisis has led to some innovative approaches um, and no doubt some of these uh, will outlive uh, COVID-19. Um, today we're looking beyond that crisis and I think today's event is, is a manifestation of that optimistic outlook forward. Um, the joint initiative between QQI and the National Forum has progressed an agenda over the past year, which has very much focused on uncovering and discussing the opportunities and challenges involved in work integrated learning. Um, the aim is very much to ensure that the education and training community can take a holistic and well-informed approach to quality enhancement. Uh, our quality assurance uh, and enhancement for the benefit of all uh, involved. So I greatly welcome this initiative and uh, I applaud the conversations stimulated to date through the previous two webinars. And I look forward to further conversations and activities which will emanate from this inaugural uh, national symposium. This is very much not the end of this initiative, uh, perhaps the end of the beginning as it develops with further activities into 2021, and you will hear uh, more about those at the end of this event. So finally, uh, I must thank our expert presenters, our speakers and facilitators who've made this event possible. And I know it's going to be um, a very thought provoking and insightful day. And I certainly look forward to hearing further about the next steps uh, to be taken in 2021. So thank you very much. Uh, enjoy the day and back to you, Peter. 
Thank you very much, uh, Joanne. Uh, I'd like now, like now to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Geraldine O'Neill um, to remind us what we have learned from the um, work-based assessment webinars that we held in, in June and October. Geraldine is uh, would be known to, I, I imagine, many of you. Many of you. Um, she's an associate professor and educational developer at UCD's Teaching and Learning Unit. Um, and in June this year, she received a research fellowship from the uh, National Forum uh, for the Enhancement of Teaching and Learning, which she is using to research work-based uh, learning and assessment. So over to you, Geraldine. Thank you very much. Um... Maybe you could put up the slides here. Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much for that. <clears throat> okay, well, just to say um, that we're not starting from scratch today with the conversations. As, as Peter and Joanne have said, um, much has gone on before. Um, QQI were involved in a green paper on assessment and the National Forum um, had an enhancement theme around um, assessment. Um, so we've learned a lot already in relation to work-based assessment and today is really building on that work. Um, the so, so maybe you could progress the slide there, Catherine. Um, <clears throat> so as Peter was saying, there has been a series of um, work-based assessment events um, this year alone that we sort of just started the conversation. And the aim of these events was to try and have conversations and discussions around some of the challenges and opportunities in work-based assessment very timely given the COVID-19 situation that we could really relook at the work-based assessment um, context and looking at what's happening in this space. So back in June, um, we had a webinar number one around the shared challenges and opportunities with over 120 people attended that <coughs> um, event in June. And we looked at shared challenges and opportunities. We then built into webinar number two, which was going deeper. And this allowed us to explore one particular challenge in particular, which happened to be consistency. Um, and that happened relatively recently on the 14th of October. And this led in some ways to the symposium today, which is around getting to grips with policies and practice. But in between, we also set up a work-based assessment learning community uh, where we encourage discussions around the different issues to do with work-based assessment. So I'm just going to go through some of the things that we learned in relation to these. Um, the first thing that we learned, sorry, could you go back once that? Yeah, the first thing that we learned was that assessment has a broad meaning. So when we think about assessment, whether it's work-based or not, assessment definition has a broad meaning. And this work built on the national enhancement themes uh, work on assessment. And what we mean when we talk about assessment is that assessment... Ger 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 Geraldine, can I interrupt for a moment? Your, your microphone seems to be crackling a little bit. I wonder whether adjusting it might, might help. Um, I can't, sorry, Peter, I, I, I can't do anything about that. Sorry. Colin, unless you can help me with that one. Uh, Geraldine, your audio is coming through perfect here for me. Is it? Okay. Um, okay. Perfect for me too. Okay, all right. Okay, but thanks for that, Peter. Um, I'll, I'll continue if that's all right then. Um, so assessment has a broad meaning. This is the National Forum's definition of assessment, and it's very appropriate for work-based assessment because it looks at assessment of learning, which is summative, and that's the graded piece that's very high stakes for students. But it's not only that. Assessment also means assessment for learning and assessment as learning. And these are often called formative assessments. And these are really clear and, and really important in relation to assessment. And they include feedback. The purple there includes feedback for students so they know how well they're doing. So that can be feedback from um, the employers, from the, the higher education staff. But really, really important on the left there is assessment as learning. <clears throat> and that's where students learn to self-monitor and judge their own work. And in work-based assessment, this is really important as students are really central to learning what is, is um, knowing how well they are doing. Okay, the next thing we learned and building on that is that there's three key partners and there's more as Joanne mentioned in work-based assessment. 
And this was work that was done as part of the National Forum, again, enhancement theme. The student is the center at it. They are the most important person in this piece. Um, they need to know how well they're doing and they need to be part of the assessment. But on the right, you have work-based staff. And then on the left, you have higher education or further education staff. Three key um, partners in work-based assessment with the student at the center, really, really important in their empowerment in it and how they actually, how well they know they, they are doing through the assessment as learning. The next thing we learned, this was from webinar one, is that there are many different work contexts that people uh, are in. And there's much, uh, many different terminology around these work-based um, contexts. Um, and I know Nora will build on this work when she's giving her keynote. Uh, when we asked people in, in webinar one, we found out that there are many different contexts from applied research, apprenticeships, internships, traineeships, and other. Um, and when we explored what people meant by other, they talked about things like teaching practice, skills, workshops, programs of um, management skills. So there's much um, different language around this place. So we know that people are in many different contexts. Students are going to many different placements and that are called many different things. So we need to get, I suppose, a better understanding of the language around this. The next thing we learned in webinar one was that people had particular challenges. And again, we, we learned when we asked people, well, what are your challenges? Um, and 138 in, in this webinar said that in relation to assessment, which is that green circle in the middle, one of the things that came out a lot was consistency. How do we have consistent um, assessment? And that linked with standards and grading approaches. But they also mentioned feedback, authentic and relevant assessment and student engagement. And in some ways, this has led to some of the topics that we have chosen for the, the seminar today. So they were the things that came through. Lots of many other things came through as challenges, but these particularly came through. Then when we said, well, let's have a webinar, particularly around consistency, because that's what people are looking for. And what do we learn, I suppose, from this particular webinar? Well, we learned that there's many different types of consistency. There's consistency between assessors, often called interrater reliability, consistency across contexts, consistency across tasks, and consistency over time. And again, we asked the participants in this webinar, uh, what were the particular challenges in relation to these um, consistency? And what they came through was assessors, consistency between assessors is the one that people are most challenged by. Um, you know, one assessor not, um, you know, um, giving the same sort of grades or same sort of feedback as another assessor. And the consistency across contexts is another one that was coming through. But tasks and times in the work-based learning context are not as particularly a, a challenge. So in, when we explored consistency a little bit more in that webinar, we learned that standards and grades are really key to sort of things being consistent. They're sort of the core. If the standards are correct, they do have the consistency, really important. But work-based learning is like shifting sands. Um, unlike the kind of controlled environment that you have in the institution, work-based learning contexts are very mobile, maybe shifting like sands, particularly the context change. The students on the left there are different and they're unique. The staff have different views on assessments and attitudes to assessment, and the task and tools may differ. So some of the solutions that we came across were things like the grading approaches, the age old debate about pass fail or grading or how do you grade, importance of maybe moderation, importance of well designed rubrics, staff training is one of the solutions, the development of a community of practice for assessors building some collaborative approaches, student self-monitoring so that they're involved in the process and enabling policies. And then finally, a concluding thought from this webinar, because we have more to learn in the space and more to learn today. And this is from one of our keynotes, Rola, so I wanted to, to quote, quote her. Uh, we did say though, consistency is really important and it came up as, as I say, for, for people in the webinars. But work-based assessment design requires a compromise 
between contextualization and standardization. So the educational impact and validity of the assessment might not be worth sacrificing in the pursuit of reliability. So I think this is an important thought just might set us up for the day that there's a, a balance here to be found between validity of the assessment and the reliability and consistency. So I'll leave you with that thought. I will just put the references up there for, so it's recorded for anybody who would like them. Um, and I'll, I'll pass back to, to Peter there. Okay, thank you, Peter. Thank you very much, uh, Geraldine. Um, I, I'm sure we've all agreed that the, the, uh, those two webinars really did provide some very rich uh, findings and, and it's good to be reminded of them again. What I would like to do now is uh, talk about briefly about the agenda today, uh, walk you through it as it were. Um, so the, the uh, <clears throat> could I have uh, slide three, please? Um, yeah, so the, yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. Uh, so the remainder of the symposium is divided into uh, three modules and then there'll be a wrap up session at the end. Um, and there'll be a break uh, of at least 10 minutes at the end of each module. In one case, there's a lunch break at the end. Um, I'd ask if you've got any questions that you'd like to ask the speakers or raise with the speakers, please enter them into the chat, into the Zoom chat. Um, and at the end of each module, we'll select some of these questions um, and put them to the speakers on your behalf. Um, the first module is at uh, 10.25 and um, it's about setting the context. Uh, it sets the scene by providing three perspectives on work integrated learning. One from a university, an education and training provider, um, another from a um, statutory uh, professional regulator, um, uh, and a third from a uh, business representative uh, group, giving the, the, the employer perspective. Um, there may be uh, time for uh, questions um, after the three presentations, uh, and uh, as I say, put, put, put those into the chat. After those uh, three presentations, there'll be a 10 minute break. And then at 11 o'clock, uh, we'll start the second module. And um, this uh, will open uh, with a presentation uh, by Nora McRae. And Nora's presentation is, has been pre recorded. Nora's in uh, Canada. Uh, she's here with us today. Uh, but um, given the time difference, uh, Nora felt it would be better to pre-record the presentation. And her presentation will explain uh, what is meant by work integrated learning. It will present a quality framework for work integrated learning and discuss the assessment of learning in the context of work integrated learning. And after the presentation, uh, there will be um, a breakout session and th this would be uh, presented to you or uh, overseen if you like uh, by a module facilitator um, and uh, you will be split into smaller groups for about 10 minutes of discussion um, and then after that 10 minutes are up the module will uh, wrap up with a plenary session for comments, uh, questions, summing up um, and uh, it should finish by about 10, uh, at about 10.50 uh, get, to give a 10 minute break before the next module. And that pattern uh, that I've just described there will, will uh, follow uh, for the next two modules. The third module um, is at 12 o'clock. Um, this will open with a presentation by Rola uh, Ajavi and it addresses the challenges of aligning assessment with the needs of work integrated learning um, and ensuring authentic assessment and the uh, arrangements for the breakout session and facilitation and so on will be similar to the to to, to that for module two and there'll be a different facilitator um, there'll be a break then uh, at 12 50 um, for lunch um, 
And uh, during these breakout sessions, the, the Zoom will be active. There will be some music playing in the background. Uh, and we'll expect you to come back at 13.30 uh, sharp for the fourth module. And this will, be, this will open uh, with a presentation from Mary Kelly. Um, and it's about the assessment of professional context competence in a, a placement session. In a, and it includes reflection on understandings of competence in a professional work setting, uh, addresses modes of assessment, and provides some practical examples in the context of teacher education uh, for you to consider. Uh, again, the, the arrangements of the breakout sessions and facilitation of, of discussion will, will be similar to the previous two modules. Um, and then there'll be a concluding part at uh, 14 uh, 20 at uh, 20 past two. Uh, this will begin with um, a reflection on the day's proceedings uh, from a student perspective. Um, and um, it will finish up with uh, two presentations, one from the National Forum um, and another from QQI, outlining uh, the next steps uh, uh, for, for this area. Um, I'd like to, uh, so that's the agenda for today. I'd like to, to remind all of the speakers that uh, brevity is the soul of wit and request that they adhere strictly to the times allocated. Um, and I'd like to remind all participants again that we are recording the symposium and that uh, the video will be available after the event. So we're marginally um, ahead of time um, at this point. Um, so I'd like to um, invite uh, uh, Anne-Marie Ryan um, to, well, let, let me just, I'd like to move to module one. So module one um, helps set the scene, as, as, as I said earlier on. Uh, we're going to hear three different perspectives on work-based assessment. Um, we'll have a learner perspective at the end of the day, as I've said. And um, our first um, speaker is uh, Kirsten May. And uh, she will give a, um, a HEI perspective or a university perspective on uh, work-based assessment. Kirsten is the um, interim president of the University of Limerick, and I would invite uh, Professor May to uh, give her presentation now, and you have six or seven minutes. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, um, uh, and hello everyone. I'm very pleased uh, to uh, be at this symposium today to think about, uh, to talk about work-based assessment. Um, the University of Limerick, uh, has uh, a work-based uh, learning uh, at, uh, in its DNA. It was uh, developed uh, uh, with the inception of the this higher education institution. And it was one of the factors that very much attracted me to the university <clears throat> when I joined it in 2018, initially as Vice President of Academic Affairs and Student Engagement. I would like to put my thoughts on um, assessment of work-based uh, learning uh, into a wider context. That is the strategic goals of jobs. Uh, if you look at the Irish knowledge economy and the correspondence between uh, the graduate attributes that higher education institutions have developed, uh, the knowledge and skills uh, needed for the economy and the shaping force of higher education uh, in the future agenda um, um, uh, for jobs. The resilience and growth of the and competitiveness of the economy, which requires talent with the right competencies and skills and knowledge, and of course inclusion as a key uh, issue <clears throat> in the work towards a fair and prosperous society. Secondly, we have to bear in mind uh, that we are currently in a situation where we experience experiencing radical and rampant uh, changes to professional fields and occupational patterns through digitization, artificial intelligence and machine learning automation, and not least globalization, which will affect the context and concepts, forms and formats of work-based learning and how it is assessed. And therefore there is a review required that takes into account the need for diversification and potentially change of work-based learning. And I have to confess that I actually uh, favor the term work-integrated learning because it reflects a very different context in which the uh, in which professional contexts are being integrated uh, into education. 
I would like to briefly talk about work-based learning. That is where the learning takes place within the workplace. Uh, and for students, uh, and I hope students forgive me that I speak on their behalf, uh, that uh, requires uh, 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 that uh, they are be being enabled to develop their um, attributes uh, uh, for towards graduate employability. Uh, that they're being enabled to apply discipline specific knowledge in professional context, engage in real world and active and experiential learning, acquire professional competencies in, in health, in teacher education, engineering, and other professionally accredited programs, and uh, hone their uh, transferable skills from metacognition, problem solving, teamwork, communication, but also coping with ambiguity and complexity, which is increasingly important and have an opportunity to uh, be empowered by identifying the gaps in their own knowledge and skills and inform their future career decisions and their learning for, for the future. From uh, the HEI uh, perspective, uh, work-based learning uh, is a very important uh, a part in uh, the development uh, of employer relations in informing the development of our curriculum, the relevance of programs of studies uh, and their learning objectives, um, and uh, for us to also be at the table to shape the dialogue about the employability uh, of the future. And that has to be reflected in the dialogue about the assessments of work-based uh, learning, particularly where we may move to much more du dual education modes, i.e. where you have half of um, the education taking place within the academic context and half within industry uh, uh, settings. Um, I would like to look at assessments for uh, of for and as learning within our cooperative education. Uh, we very much use the assessment uh, as a reflective exercise uh, at the end uh, of the um, uh, ex uh, placement experience. It is a pass fail um, assessed report by the students uh, to reflect on their learning during the placement. Um, uh, on the experience uh, and uh, on their future uh, uh, career choices. That allows us to fe uh, also feedback to employers about the placements. Uh, there are different challenges for uh, competency-based learning uh, in the different areas, and we will hear about that uh, earlier. What I wanted to highlight for us uh, as higher education providers is the close collaboration uh, with uh, practitioners and uh, supervisors in terms of informing expectations, standards, uh, and working closely together uh, to uh, support uh, the <clears throat> In, in integrity um, of the application and expectation management on part of the students. Here, assessments are often um, <clears throat> uh, graded on a slide of developmental meeting competencies and exceeding competencies. But there are emerging areas uh, that uh, need to be looked at as well. And I would like to highlight three. First of all, that is the area of community engagement, where students, for instance, in the practicum, work in, with, and through communities uh, to address uh, social issues. Here we have to uh, um, look at the context in which assessment takes place, um, particularly uh, in terms of sensibility to power relations um, and others. We have to look at uh, the different uh, employability requirements for students and take into account that many students uh, will uh, engage in portfolio um, uh, work and patchwork careers and need to um, be equipped to be self-determined uh, learners. That means uh, entrepreneurial approaches to uh, uh, work, and I call it work integrated learning here, where students develop their own projects within a professional context, need to take into account how we deal with calculated risk taking and failure teamwork um, uh, in the assessment and feedback in a meaningful way. Um, and last but not least, uh, when we look at how work-based context uh, are integrated into the learning within the universities through industry projects and so on. I would like to throw up one topic here for assessment and that is uh, commercially sensitive information, uh, IP. How do we deal with that, particularly in terms of assessment, making assessments available, using it for evaluations? Um, how do we uh, 
develop the relationship with the employers. To wrap up, and I would have liked to say much more, is I have a number of questions. When we look at assessments for work-based learning, besides the focus on authenticity, consistency of assessment of work-based learning, we have to continue to consider issues such as standardization of assessment as part of quality insurance and the integrity of academic awards, equivalency in order to safeguard equality of uh, opportunity for students and fairness. Uh, we also have to take into account uh, different literacies um, and um, develop our assessments, taking into account the opportunities of digital technologies in relation also to the capacity and capabilities of assessors in the higher education institutions, but also in our um, uh, um, um, employers and uh, uh, professional uh, areas. And I stop here because I'm exceeding my time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Kirsten, and uh, <coughs> I'd like to, to move on then now to our uh, next speaker, who's uh, Anne-Marie Ryan. Uh, Anne-Marie is the Director of Professional Standards and Education with the Nursing and Midwifery Board of Ireland, and will give a professional regulator perspective. Over to you, Anne-Marie. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Peter. I'm, I'm delighted like that to be able to join such a, a wonderful audience that I know we have today. Um, and I suppose just to put a small bit of context on, I'm hoping I can share my screen. Can I, yep. can I share my screen, please? Uh, um, I suppose just to put a small bit of context on this is that nursing has been regulated since uh, 1919, but in 1977 uh, there was an EU directive to harmonise education across Europe so that nurses could move all around Europe. And that was in the time when nursing education was an apprenticeship type model. And within that, uh, half of the programme had to be clinical instruction. So you can see that on this slide, um, that the clinical instruction there in front of it, what was actually required. Now, that actually hasn't changed since 1977. So we'll say, well, OK, well, so what, Anne -Marie? What's the thing of that? Well, the, the significance of that was when we went into a nurse education um, undergraduate degree programme in 2002 with the 13 higher education institutions that are currently offering the programme, um, that posed a bit of a difficulty for some of those HEIs um, because we had to be compliant with the directive as such, but also um, more specifically, for, uh, so we wanted to actually move from our education program that was syllabus driven to a terminal outcomes model based on six domains of competence to achieve the, the outcomes that you can see there on the slide because we believed that this actually was what we needed for a registered nurse um, in uh, uh, from coming out of a degree programme. So we developed these requirements and standards back in 2002, they were reviewed in 2005. And then um, the Department of Health actually undertook a review of the undergraduate programme back in 2012. Um, and this was undertaken with a wide stakeholder group. Uh, there was evaluation st um, strategy within it. It was, the, it was quite a comprehensive review, in fact, at the time. But one of the findings of the review at the time was that there was a failure to fail um, some of the students. So within that, then, one of the report recommendations that came out, and you can see sort of the most important part of it there in green, is that the board, uh, in conjunction with the health services executive and that and the higher education institutions, would review student clinical assessment processes, including the documentation to promote standardization of clinical assessments in line with competency goals for the four undergraduate programs that we had. Um, now, the significance of this was, uh, uh, and why it was really important as well, is that there were clinical sites that uh, a number of HEIs were sharing. So that if you had one particular college was using one particular site, you could have clinical staff, if they were um, assessing students in the clinical area, that they in fact would have maybe two or three pieces of documentation to, to negotiate. So, um, this sort of caused some challenges for the regulator in relation to the assessment of clinical learning, because as you know, as I've said before, that the programme was half clinical instruction. So we really had to link work-based learning to work-based assessment. Uh, we were required then to really to ensure that the supports were in place for the learning and the assessment of learning. So that from the regulator's point of view, we had to be, we had to be assured that the assessment of learning was there to be able to, in, in, to, take, uh, to ensure that the assessment could occur. 
So there, there were structures in place and these were put in place by the Department of Health when we set up the programme in the first place. So there were preceptors, so all staff nurses who were associated with uh, students in the placement area, they were all trained to be preceptors and we have a whole mechanism on how to do that. We then developed a new grade of worker, which was a clinical placement coordinator with a ratio of one to 30 students. And they were to support students in the clinical area and ensure that the learning opportunities were there for them. We had then this other grade of practice development coordinator who oversaw the clinical placement coordinator, but also sort of ensured that there was quality learning um, in environments, that there were correct policies, that evidence-based practice was there, that they really had this focus on quality. And then there was the linked lectures, of course. Um, the standards then of NMBI that I sort of referred to earlier, they state what support should be in the clinical environment to meet the assessment of competence. And we are required then by our legislation to do site inspections every five years. So uh, as part of this, we need now to explore how competence is measured and by who. How issues are dealt with in the clinical area, how issues are escalated, how students can appeal an issue how the resolution of differences can be achieved in partnership between the HEI and the health services provider. Because for successful work-based learning and assessment requires an investment in all of these things, all, uh, and this is really what we are trying to um, measure when we go in on our clinical site visits. So just to show, well, what did we do in order to address that finding that the Department of Health had in 2012. So as part of the implementation process um, of, of those findings, um, NMBI, in partnership with, um, their, with the HEIs, with the 13 HEIs, having a steering committee, they developed these, uh, these particular tools based on four principles, that the response base scale is that the student is competent or not competent. So the competence is either achieved or it's not achieved. The judgments rather than objective observations are sought, that the assessment should focus on competencies that are central to the activity being observed, and that the assessors who are best placed to judge performance are actually the preceptors, the people who are on the ground. So we developed these tools. These tools were shared with all the HEIs and each one of the HEIs has adapted these uh, for their own purposes. That's to include their own logos, their local rules and procedures and all of those sort of other good things that need to be within uh, the, their own system. So these are available to anybody. For, we don't have them actually on our website, but if anybody would like them, we'd be happy to share them with you. So in real terms, how does this work from year one to year four? So uh, from the, the preceptor or the mentors through three structured meetings during the duration of a clinical placement, um, they will uh, uh, identify and assess where the student uh, is within this trajectory. Uh, we, as I say, we have these um, 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 particular uh, scales. Uh, Benner is one that we use within nursing. And like that, um, her Benner's were seminal work was from 1984. But it looks about looking at a person as being a novice, being an advanced beginner, and then becoming competent. Um, the, we also then use some Steinecker and Bell's um, level of uh, a scale and also then what type of supervision is required of the student and at the end of the four-year program the students actually have to work uh, under distance supervision where they are required to internalize and disseminate their information so the biggest challenge for us then as the regulator is how do can we keep up with all the scientific and technical advancements that are required within service using an old directive so as i said we're looking at chronic disease management we're looking at new models of care of uh, how health Healthcare is being delivered. So these are the challenges that our health service our health service providers and our HEIs are dealing with at the moment, and that we as the regulator need to be responsive to. So thank you, uh, Peter. I hope I haven't over uh, uh, taken the, my time. Certainly not. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Anne Marie. That was uh, fascinating. Um, and we'll move on now to our uh, third uh, perspective, and this one is from um, uh, Claire McGee. Um, she is a head of education and innovation policy for IBEC, and uh, Claire will give us an employer perspective. Over to you, Claire. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation to join you here this morning. Um, I, I I find this this whole topic actually incredibly interesting. I think both both all our opening speakers and, and in particular, uh, Professor May really highlighted, I think that the, the opportunity for Ireland within uh, work-based assessment, work-based learning, and, and I wholeheartedly agree that maybe we need to be moving 
uh, towards a more um, inclusive concept around work integrated uh, assessment and learning. So the perspective I think I'd like to share with you this morning is perhaps why is this important, uh, obviously, for industry? What are some of the challenges and how can how can industry and education and I suppose the broader uh, system work in partnership together to try and uh, deliver, I suppose, common outcomes, common goals. Um, so just putting putting the industry perspective on it, um, industry is now one of Ireland's kind of largest incubators of talent, let's just say, and, and they can do that through kind of four means. And now people are talking about the industrial kind of four Bs when it comes to uh, recruiting people into the organization. They either buy it in, so that's through their traditional recruitment and hiring practices. They build it, so they, they train their own and they, they implement their own internal learning and development strategy. They borrow uh, that talent, so they outsource maybe a specific task. Um, or thirdly, they bridge uh, maybe with other organizations through collaborations. But actually, when I look at kind of work-based assessment and work integrated learning, I see that maybe it's a case that this is actually a concept of all four of those different Bs where industry and um, education providers can actually work together to deliver those common outcomes. So a little over two years ago, maybe it's just under two years ago, um, I worked within my, with my colleagues and I to develop our Smarter World, Smarter Work campaign. And that campaign was really around, um, I suppose, us providing some, some input into this kind of global conversation around the future of work. Uh, and as part of that, I developed a series of um, policy recommendations around improving graduate employability skills. And I'm very happy to circulate uh, th that document um, maybe after after this, but actually it speaks to around enhancing uh, employability skills for graduates, but also how do we kind of connect uh, industry, uh, business and the education institution closer together to kind of help people transition in and out of work that little bit easier. Because of the one thing we know, there is no more that traditional job for life. You may join an organization uh, when, when you graduate, but actually you'll probably have multiple careers within that organization or indeed you'll join an organization, stay with them for a couple of years and then transition into different industry sectors or different careers. So our aim with this, these set of guidelines was really around developing those kind of key employability skills couched around personal leadership. So that, that, that kind of self-motivation, self-awareness, uh, building your own curiosity, creativity, uh, your capacity to make things happen. So that entrepreneurial mindset that, that, that Kirsten spoke about. Also about kind of marrying that then with the subject knowledge um, and understanding around how you apply that subject knowledge. So around communication, literacy, logical and analytical reason. And then finally, the third kind of piece of that jigsaw is around business acumen uh, and understanding, I suppose, business or customer awareness, uh, creative problem solving, networking, team working and collaboration and how that all works together. Our aim with that was ultimately to really help the student to become that self-reflective practitioner. Um, so therefore that when they actually transition full-time into the workplace, they kind of have built those positive habits that maybe work-based assessment can, do, can help them. So help them unlock their learning, maybe when they return back into the institution after having a period of time, uh, maybe on, on work placement. One thing that was really important, I think, from Geraldine's slides that I really want to pick up on is that huge continuum of work-based learning uh, and work and integrated learning as well. And it comes really from that very kind of formal, highly regulated uh, clinical placement uh, that Anne-Marie just spoke about, right through to you know apprenticeship, traineeship, workplace project work, um, hackathons, um, and, and different things like that. So we mustn't forget that there's a huge spectrum here um, and that probably creates multiple challenges, not only just for yourselves within the institutions and how you assess that, but also for the students in terms of identifying what's the best opportunity uh, for that. The benefits for industry, and I think we must also reflect on this a little bit. Obviously, it helps them identify a more st sustainable, uh, stable uh, talent pipeline that ultimately it can create a more diverse talent pipeline for them as well. It can help narrow the skills gap. Um, and that's actually something we need to be very conscious of over the next little while because of rising youth unemployment levels coming out of the pandemic. 
We need to be very careful that we're not allocating people just into jobs to get them into jobs, that we're actually being very kind of uh, targeted in our labour activation measures and our activation supports to making sure that we're allocating people into the right areas for them and also again for our economy and for our society. So it's about really making sure that people are kind of working together because while it might be a short term measure just to get people into jobs right now, that will have major implications for our economy and our society in about two or three years time. So really kind of tightening that gap between um, supply and demand around education. So there's some obviously as well, there's great opportunity to increase productivity and innovation levels because you keep that loop open between the workplace, the industry and then the institution. And I think that's always a really positive thing. But one thing I want to kind of wrap up on before we, we before I finish my, my 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 points here and we can have some Q&A, the challenge of getting employers involved. And that's that's something that's not that's not like I don't take lightly and I appreciate it is a major challenge because education delivery is not their core business. But ultimately, if you want to build those deeper partnerships, it's about engaging with industry as early as we possibly can so that actually it's a, it can be kind of rather than shoehorning industry at the very end when you have to find work placement or an opportunity to, to manage that assessment. It has to be borne up from the, uh, from the very beginning. The other thing I'd like to mention is let's not forget about SMEs in Ireland and the potential to do work based assessment with SMEs. It's very easy to kind of fall into the uh, the I suppose the safe zone where we know that larger companies have the capacity to actually do some of that more, um, I suppose, formal, formal work uh, based assessment. But there's huge opportunity within our SME base. Uh, the profile of SME is changing in Ireland as well. There's some great innovative companies. Uh, out there, but they really need the skill set that are coming from the institutions at the moment, particularly with the pace of change that they're trying to deal with. So I'd kind of really implore maybe some of the career service practitioners who may be in the audience today to really reflect on that and to think about, is there an opportunity there with a lot of our SMEs to support kind of getting, getting young people, getting this skill set that they so desperately need into their businesses to help them to grow uh, for the future. Uh, I'll leave it there because I, I'm sure there's plenty of uh, good questions coming from, from, the, from the audience, but uh, delighted to be able to participate on, on this module this morning. I think it's an incredibly important one. Uh, the policy, obviously the national skills strategy sets out this, this policy, it's quite ambitious, but let's try and work together with, with enterprise, with industry, to be able to identify more opportunities across that continuum to help young people kind of transition into the world of work. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Claire. And uh, we now have about uh, a minute or, or so for questions. Um, but the uh, before we take a ten-minute break before the next session, um, now I don't see um, uh, a lot of questions in the chat. So what, what I would ask uh, the, the audience to, to think about for the rest of the day is, 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 is getting those questions in there so that we can uh, we can put them to the speakers. I would question myself, uh, if I may, um, since there aren't any in the chat. Um, uh, that is that um, we, we often hear that, that it's so important to, to get um, education and training institutions, whether they're further education institutions or higher education institutions, employers and uh, let's call them professional re regulatory or statutory bodies uh, talking, uh, uh, communicating together um, to, 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 to in, in the context of uh, developing um, uh, opportunities for work integrated learning uh, and finding solutions to challenges in working work integrated learning. Um, what can be done to facilitate that kind of communication? I'd, I'd, I'd invite our speakers to, to uh, comment on that. And then uh, uh, I see a few questions coming through in the chat now. Would anybody like to take up that question? Any of the speakers? Yeah. Um... Start. Well, maybe let, if someone else wants to start first, I've just spoken. Yeah, well, I'm happy to take that, um, uh, Peter. I think that one of the issues is that um, because we are uh, the nursing programs are required, if you like, through legislative frameworks to be integrated, that there is a requirement for this. So we have processes in place like um, 
uh, practice agreements, we have um, governance structures as memorandum of understanding between the HEI and the, the clinical sites. There's audit then of clinical sites. So there's, it's actually a very difficult program to put on from the HEI's point of view to, to actually develop a, a nursing education program because of that notion of integration and the need for uh, the assessment of clinical learning to be uh, part of that HEI structure. So um, I suppose it, it, good governance structures, I suppose, is, is the main thing that I see that, that really works with it. And uh, they're the things then that, that we look to when we go and do our site inspections. Okay. Thanks very much, Anne-Marie. Did you want to come into that uh, on that, Claire? Uh, yeah, just I think actually, if we really want to prioritize this um, as a, a you know as an institutional priority, it requires specific resources, um, and it requires kind of management. You know, from a like, it's not just a case of one individual within one department has to build that bridge with the industry. It actually probably requires almost a management system behind it. Um, and I think that's that's going to be a big challenge. And, you know, many, many times in our budget submissions uh, to, to government, we have called for institutions to be resourced appropriately, to have business liaison managers that can really kind of make that connection, bring the appropriate people uh, around the table, set out that common agenda, because ultimately if it's left to just one or two individuals, uh, and you know they move on they're very it's a very organic kind of situation and it doesn't enable kind of it to, for it to become a little bit more systemic a little bit more kind of managed and um, because you never know if this is just one element of that um of, of industry engagement is work-based assessment but there could be many other opportunities that could accrue out of it um, and if there is a bit more of a systemic approach to it, hinge points. Um, which is off the top of my head, I think CIT run a very good program around this through their um, extended campus network. And it'd be fantastic if something like that could be a bit more mainstreamed across across the country or across different um, institutions. Um, Professor May highlighted that, you know, industry experience there is part of the UL DNA. And I, I would wholeheartedly agree with that. So it's very much, industry are, are really aware of the institutions that do this well and therefore are very happy to work with those institutions year after year after year and I think then because they've built them and, and they've got good people in situ to be able to kind of I suppose bridge that gap between industry and I think we've lost sound there. Oh. <coughs> Hello? I can hear you. Have I hit mute? We can hear you, Claire. Oh yeah, sorry. I uh that, that they, I don't know, did I lose did I lose sound there for a few minutes? Seems to be okay now. Just a little bit. Okay. Mm. I, I think I've made my point anyway. It's, a, it's really about kind of just putting a good system, a management system in place with good people who can bridge that gap between industry and academia. It's it, and really it's it's difficult to make it rely on just one or two individuals who perhaps have the appetite and the interest to do it. Okay, uh, th th thanks very much, Claire. Um, and uh, I, I did, Kirsten, did do you, do you want to come in on that on that issue? Uh, very, very. We very briefly, I, I just wanted to add, uh, it, we need to give consideration to, to, to the recognition of prior learning as much as to the recognition of prior experience where we can uh, in our approach to work integrated learning. That's, and, and we have to work out how we do that best in order to safeguard uh, uh, standards and a quality of opportunity. Uh, that's an ongoing project. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so I think we, we, we it's fantastic that we're starting to get some really good questions in the uh, Zoom chat group now. Unfortunately, we've we've uh, run out of time in this session, but we have captured all those questions and, and, and we'll uh, pass them on to the to the to the speakers to to uh, to comment on. So I, I, I wrap up this uh, session now. We um, we're due back at uh, 11 o'clock. Uh, for the uh, next session. So we have a, a five-minute break.
um, and we're due back at 11 o'clock. This is a, this will be kicked off by a, a presentation from uh, Dr. Nora McRae uh, from the University of Waterloo in Canada. And the title of the presentation will be the assessment of quality of work integrated learning and considerations for the future of work. And immediately after the um, uh, Nora's presentation, uh, Professor Michelle uh, Miller, uh, Dean of Students of N uh, at NUIG, uh, will facilitate uh, the breakout session and uh, the um, uh, follow-up question and answer session uh, at, at the end of the module. So um, over to uh, Dr. McRae's presentation. Catherine. Hi, Aline, you should be able to share your screen there now. Good morning, everyone. My name is Nora McRae, and I'm the Associate Provost of Cooperative and Experiential Education at the University of Waterloo in Waterloo, Canada. And it's my pleasure to be with you this morning to um, present the assessment of quality work integrated learning or will and considerations for the future of work. Before I start, though, I would like to acknowledge that the University of Waterloo, where this work was created, is located on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee people. And the University of Waterloo is situated on the Haldeman Track the land promised to the Six Nations that includes 10 kilometers on each side of the Grand River. Before I get started, I wanted to provide a bit of a background on work integrated learning and the definition and models as we understand them in the Canadian context. So first of all, uh, the way we define work integrated learning is that it is a model and process of experiential education, which formally and intentionally integrates a student's academic studies with learning in a workplace or practice setting. It normally includes an engaged partnership between three partners, the academic institution, a host organization or an employer and a student. And it can, it can occur at the course or program level and include the development of learning outcomes that relate to employability, personal agency and lifelong learning. And I would direct you to CWIL, that's our Cooperative Education and Work Integrated Learning Association for Canada, to the website, um, and I can provide the links to that because the definition is there, as is this, uh, nine types of will, because we've identified across the Canadian uh, landscape these nine types. There are apprenticeships, which really align with particular trades. There are There's entrepreneurship, where students are running their own business or startup. There's service learning, which really engages um, community partnerships and uh, is usually of a unpaid and shorter duration. Applied research, where students are applying and working on research projects within perhaps an industry setting or a research lab of some sort. There are internships, which typically in a program, there is there is one internship. It's usually a singular event, which could be any length of time. There is cooperative education, which is the program that is very prevalent at the University of Waterloo, where I am from. So co-op has a very particular definition within the Canadian context. Uh, work terms are full time. They are at least four months. They are paid and they are interspersed among within the uh, students academic program. So they might do a, a year or two of coursework up front, then a work term and then an academic term, a work term, an academic term, and that kind of thing. So over the course of the, the, their time, for example, at the University of Waterloo, uh, when they graduate, they might have four or five or six paid work terms of four months each under their belt before they graduate. And last year, we did 21,000 of these paid work experiences in 62 countries. Field placements is another form of work integrated learning, and these typically are happening um, where a student is out for a brief period of time in the field, developing technical skills, um, additional know-how. Think of, for example, the geography student who's spending some time out in the field doing um, surveying or mapping, that kind of thing. 
professional, mandatory professional uh, practicum or clinical placements. These are often in the health fields, nursing, physiotherapy. Uh, there could be education as well, social work. Those kind of programs are typically, and they're typically aligned with a licensing requirement. And then work experience is a, is a bucket, and we call these all buckets to uh, uh, allow for quite a bit of variation where each institution can call things slightly differently. But each of these buckets have, have these components. And the work experience bucket is one that it's hard to put into any of the others, but it still has the same fundamental connections to workplaces and with the same desire for um for learning outcomes as stated. Be after we had defined across Canada what work integrated learning was and the nine different types, we felt it was very important to develop a quality framework. And I'm going to go through this quite quickly with you and point you to the publication of a white paper that came out of the Work Learn Institute, which is uh, within my portfolio at the University of Waterloo, because we published this white paper and developed this quality framework that uh, really uh, has been shared quite a bit and uh, we feel is very helpful in in identifying regardless of which of those nine types and how and who you're doing it with that there are some quality components that apply so let me go through that very quickly and we call this the AAA framework uh, because to keep it simple we've tried to to um, identify things according to some the letters a so first of all there are five stakeholders involved in work integrated learning, students, host organizations, educators, governments and institutions. Typically, those are the five stakeholders and they have their advocates. For example, in the case of students, their uh, parents might be their advocates, for example. And each of these stakeholders, and here's the first A, each of these stakeholders have aims, their own goals, their own purpose, their own reason for why they are engaging in work integrated learning, each of the stakeholders. And so the first part of quality is understanding what these aims are. So in very high level terms, uh, students, for example, often want to get hands on learning. They want to apply their theory. They want to get some technical or, or soft skills. They want to become more employable. Institutions engage in work integrated learning because it's sometimes used as a recruitment mechanism or retention mechanism. They want to connect with industry. They want um, to show governments or funders the relevance of their curriculum. Governments, and again, this is very context specific. This is, this is the, these are the typical aims as we find them in Canada. It may be very different in your context, but in the Canadian context, governments are very interested in graduate employability how universities are connecting with community, what we're doing about closing skill gaps, how we're contributing to economic development productivity. Employers are usually very interested in will as a, as a form of recruiting talent, engaging their staff, um, and developing um, supervisory capabilities in their staff, for example, getting projects completed, you know, connecting to academic institutions. And educators are usually very interested in will because they see it as a way to engage their students, uh, deepen their students' appreciation of the discipline, that kind of thing, and a, an opportunity to renew curriculum. So given those aims, then the second circle, the second A, are what are the actions needed to be taken to reach those aims? So their aims are, are clear. Now what needs to happen so that those aims can be realized? And again, regardless of the type of WILL program, we've also come up with this um, acronym, PEAR, P-E-A-R, that identifies that these four components need to be present to ensure that the actions that are taken are quality actions that support work integrated learning. So P is for pedagogy, E is for experience, A is for assessment, and R is reflection. So I'll go through this very quickly. And again, the, the white paper has it in greater detail, but basically there has to be some pedagogy that happens to set the students up with the right kinds of content knowledge or skill development required to be effective in a will experience. That has to happen before. Often there's some pedagogy that can happen during the experience to help them be even more effective. And afterwards, as they consider what happens next or what they do next in their, in their curricular journey. The E for experience, uh, and you'll see that I've broken this down not only in a temporal way, you know, what needs to happen to set up before the experience, during and after so that it's a meaningful experience, but that each stakeholder has a role to play. So students, the host organization, the institution itself all have roles to play before, during and after 
to ensure that the experience is meaningful and substantial. Uh, a is for assessment, and I'll go into this a bit more um, a bit more later. But uh, basically, uh, before assessment happens, students and employers need to understand what's being assessed and why. And this right away introduces the complexity with work integrated learning versus classroom based assessment because you have another you never you have another actor on the stage and that's the employer or the host organization partner. Then there's assessment that happens during the, the experience and who's doing it and how it's being done and when it's being done and all of that starts to become a bit messier during work integrated learning. And then again, after the experience, um, what happens to that assessment and where does that lead to? And finally, the R is for reflection. We know that experiences without a reflection don't necessarily lead to learning. And so reflection is so important and it needs to be set up beforehand so they know what students are aware of what needs to happen during the event, they're supported to have meaningful reflection, and then after, so that they know what to do with that reflection after the fact. Just like Donald, Donald Schoen's work, if you're familiar with that, reflection on, reflection for uh, experiences. And then the final A is achievements. How, you, you know the aims, you're undertaking some quality actions, how do you know whether you're achieving those things in a way that's helping you get to the aims? And so that's the, the measurement of achievements. And in this case, again, you can each of those, the components of PEAR, P-E-A-R, there are some achievements that can be measured. There can be achievements with respect to the curriculum that's set up or the kinds of experiences and the completion of those experiences, the, the sorts of assessments that are done and how well they, the students have um, achieved the, the goals. And with reflection, what kind of reflection has happened and whether they, they, they have resulted in, for example, ideally, uh, developing the habits of mind that we want in our students to deepen their learning. So putting that all together, um, basically the AAA quality will framework says that we have to articulate aims, accomplish actions, assess achievements, and then need to put into place continuous improvement so that our programs continue to be quality programs. And ways that we can gather information to know what needs to be improved is through some of these mechanisms. So student achievement records can give us a lot of information about what we might need to put into place to help students approve. Uh, there can be some program improvements that happen through curricular renewal processes or academic reviews. Um, stakeholder engagement is a great way to determine how to improve our programs. And, um, and of course, there's, there's a great deal of data that can be analyzed to consider where there might be gaps and how programs can be improved. So that is the AAA Quality Work Integrated uh, Learning Framework in a nutshell, and I would encourage you to read the white paper to learn more. So looking at the assessment of work integrated learning, if we come back to those nine models and we look at PEAR, um, which are, which are uh, we, feel, we feel are important quality um, components, there still are differences because how those quality practices are enacted differ based on the model. There, there are huge differences that are important um, that relate to how much time is spent in the experience. Similarly, the different learning outcomes that are desired and how those all relate to creating the kind of learning impact we want from our work integrated learning programs. So a handy formula that we've come up with to help understand this is that the learning outcomes that are established in the program multiplied by a concept that we're calling intensity, which is made up of how much time is spent in that experience and the quality of the actions that are put into place, those pair pieces, lead to the kind of the learning impact that we're looking for. So basically you can have all these great learning outcomes, but if the quality of the program isn't very good or the time is very, very small, you're not going to get as much impact as if you've got good, strong quality practices and a lot of time as, as well as those learning outcomes, which makes sense. So let's look at assessment again, just for um, a minute and just circle back to work integrated learning assessment. So unpacking this according to um, the, the quality framework again, you'll see that before, during and after there are things that need to be done. The student and employer need to understand what needs to be assessed. As I said before, learning goals have to be established and assessments have to be conducted 
And again, there are decisions to be made who's doing that. And then after what happens to that assessment. So let's look at some of these components. And the first one being learning outcomes and different models of work integrated learning typically have different flavors or different emphasis on the learning outcomes that are looked looked upon or, or desired. And I've put some of these here and, and um, these are by no means meant to be um, definitive or mutually exclusive because it really, really, really does depend on the, the institution and the program in which these work integrated learning experiences are embedded. But just to give you an idea, so typically in apprenticeship programs, there are trade specific skills that are being assessed. You know, if someone is being is in an apprenticeship to become a chef, for example, there's certain skills that are being um, assessed in order to get the various components of their uh, their training. Employability is a whole other range of learning outcomes, and, and they often show up in co-op programs, internships, work experience programs, of course, as well as others. So these aren't meant to be mutually exclusive. Again, I just want to qualify that. In entrepreneurship type wheel programs, often there are learning outcomes around entrepreneurial mindset and innovation and problem identification and ideation, that kind of thing you might see. Um, service learning programs, again, this kind of service to community mindset type learning outcomes, other learning outcomes you'd find from community engaged learning in different ways. Applied research, usually there's, there are research skills that are identified. In the mandatory professional practicum or clinical placements, they're often profession specific skills, again, usually um, articulated in, in relationship to a licensing body. And then in field placement, there may be some, for example, discipline specific technical skills. I'll go back to that example of say the geography student, they may have to be uh, learning GIS, for example, or, or um, certain surveying techniques as part of their field placement. In work integrated learning, the other complicating factor, of course, is who is doing the assessment. So the academic program is always involved, of course, but then depending on the nature of the model of the program, the will model, there could be different players involved, of course. So in apprenticeship, uh, um, you'll have the employer or the supervisor usually checking on those uh, the, the attainment of those skills. In the case of co-op internship work experience, the supervisor or the employer is providing some assessment. The student may be doing some assessment as well. In entrepreneurship, there isn't an employer per se or a supervisor per se because the student's running their own business. So there might be a mentor that's involved. Uh, similarly, with, a, with community service learning, there'll be a supervisor at the host organization. Often the student is engaged in self-assessment as well in service learning programs and so forth. So you'll see that the other complication with will assessment is the, the number of people or the different inputs that are being provided into the assessment. And what weighting do those inputs have? Does in a situation such as say an internship, if there's an employer who's doing an assessment and they say the student has done an absolutely terrible job and that student should fail, does that have primary weighting and the student should fail or not? I mean, those are the kinds of decisions that come into play when there are different actors uh, involved in work integrated learning, which does make it a lot a lot messier than um, when one when is creating one's own course and can assess students accordingly. The other, um, because work integrated learning is occurring in a whole range of different contexts, and students are engaged in all sorts of different kinds of activity, then how assessment is conducted can vary as well. It can, and you, it, there could be observation of students on the job doing something. There could be feedback that's provided from um, uh, co-workers or teammates um, uh, on the students' activities. The students could be doing it themselves. As I said, their supervisor could be doing it. There might be some knowledge and skill demonstration that's going on. There could be portfolios, e-portfolios, a whole range of reflective practices that students could be completing journals and vlogs and blogs and um, reports, all, all sorts of ways that students are reflecting that, that are assessed in different ways as well. So how, how these uh, assessments are conducted also adds an, an uh, element of um, complexity. 
So these, these last few slides were to point out how work integrated learning is a different kind of learning that has different considerations and contexts that need to be factored in, in order for assessment to be meaningful and um, authentic and helpful for, for all players. I now wanna talk a little bit about the future of work and what that might mean for work integrated learning and for work integrated learning assessment. Um, I mentioned that we have the Work Learn Institute um, at, at, within my portfolio run by um, Dr. Judine Preddy. And Judine and her team did an extensive research project this year. They've just also published on this uh, based on the review of the grey literature on the future of work. And they reviewed over 32 reports and looked at what are the common themes that seem to be emerging about the future of work and what are the implications for us as we educate our students and then specifically around assessing our students. So the, the six themes, and again, I'd point you to the uh, report. To, you can read it in greater detail, the white paper we've published. But the six themes, advances in technology, of course, this is nothing new, automation, AI, robots, Internet of Things, all that kind of stuff coming and the implications for workplaces. That there is going to be a responsibility for adaptation to these advances, that, and that responsibility needs to be shared by governments, by educators, by individuals, by employers and industry. That everyone's going to have to develop skill agility and transferability of skills in a range of different contexts, and uh, we've seen that right away with COVID, haven't we? That there's increasing importance of diversity and inclusive, and inclusive cultures and, and ensuring that all talent finds its way. Uh, gig economy and precarious work is something else, a trend and a theme that's increasing. And this concept of employee versus organizational values and how important it is to be aware of, of our values and, um, and the organizations, what they're saying about their values and how that affects um, the retention and, and recruitment of people. So in the case of the University of Waterloo, we've taken this future of work um, concept and we've thought about okay so what are the skills under the the area specifically of skill agility and transferability <clears throat> what are the skills our students are going to need to be successful in this future of work and we've come up with something we're calling the future ready talent framework and the future ready talent framework is made up of these four categories expanding expertise developing self building relationships and designing and delivering solutions and these, uh, these areas are all ones that um, students, no matter what they're studying, need to be thinking about developing. And what we are now using as our framework for assessing their learning on their co-op work terms and their experiential uh, opportunities, their experiences, as well as our career programming. So we want to see our students be able to develop these 12, you'll see under each of the four categories, three different talents, so 12 in total, over the course of their time with us. And you'll see how they connect to the future of work. Some of these things aren't new, for example, communication and collaboration. But when we are looking at workplaces where we may be collaborating with artificial intelligence, for example, what does that look like? Um, what are the skills that we need to be able to do that effectively? When we're communicating in remote work situations with teams made up of individual individuals from across the world, what does that look like? And so these are some of these things you will, we will have heard for decades, but they will look different and show up different in the future of work. And then the way we're thinking of assessing is not just with respect to each individual co-op work term, for example. So a student has a work experience. How have they developed self, for example? How are they assessing that? How has the employer seen that? What are, this, what are their evidence of that? But then how are we going to put that all together to assess them over the course of their program of study? And this is what we're thinking of here with our um, recognizing learning along what we call our University of Waterloo Work Integrated Learning. Your pay learning. Slips ah. Where we use the concept of they have to be able to de demonstrate that they know, they know how, they can show it, and they can do it. And you'll see in this learning path, the first step is that we have some pedagogy in advance for them where they get ready for their first work integrated learning. They have to do a certain, they have to know some, some, some material before they can even go out on an experience. Then when they're on an experience, they complete these future ready talent um, assessments and they have some professional development at the time and they and we're working on a process where they can earn badges and micro credentials potentially. 
And then we feel that they're ready for graduation and career when they have accomplished some degree of capability in each of those 12 future ready talents, and they can demonstrate them by having earned a micro credential. And then we feel that over the course of time, they've, go, they've gone through this path, they're ready for their careers and ready, and we've set them up for um, a life, lifelong learning development path as well over the course of the career. So in summary, there's some challenges with assessment and work integrated learning, which I, I think I've, under I've uh, explained already. Each student is unique. Each setting is unique. There are different issues with respect to benchmarks. There is the question of how much time people have now with COVID, the remote work integrated learning and how one does assessment when it's uh, remote, remote and how, how that works is a little different. Obviously it's done, but it just adds another layer. When students are doing self-assessment, what that uh, what that requires, and um, supervisors, and when they are assessing, what does that require? How do we train them? How capable are they? There's such variety in supervisors. How do we make sure that there's some method of there's some standardization? And then, um, what do we do to measure assessment? Do we give grades? How much of a grade? Is there a pass fail? Is it based on performance evaluation or strictly by what um, the academic supervisor has observed? And then what do we do with that assessment? Do we put it on a transcript? Do we have it in badges? Do we do micro-credentials? And what does that all look like? And how do we package it all up over the course of the student's degree so that when they do graduate, um, they have something that they can take with them that is meaningful both to themselves and to subsequent employers? I've posed some provocative questions, which I believe you're going to be breaking out into to work uh, breakout groups to discuss. And um, I'll, I won't read those out because those are available to you that I hope will that my comments and then these questions will foster some meaningful contribution or in con um, conversations amongst you. But I would like to say uh, thank you very much for the invitation to be here today. And it's been uh, lovely to go through some of these ideas. And I re really wish you very well on the rest of your forum. And that, uh, and that hopefully we can meet in person one day. And thank you very much. Good morning, colleagues. Just to say thanks very much to Dr. McRae. Um, I'm Michelle Miller. I'm the Dean of Students at NUI Galway, and I'm leading you in the facilitation here for this session. Um, so really interesting discussion from Dr. McRae, drawing our attention to assessment and the different forms that it can take, and for me, really the importance of reflexivity. So I have just a little bit of housekeeping to do here. Um, so your, do you, your uh, discussion for your breakout rooms is, what does this mean for policy and practice? So I'm now going to ask you to go directly to your breakout room to discuss the question for 15 minutes before we return to the main room. But I would ask each group to nominate a rapporteur for your room and he or she, if they could come up with four to five short comments or points arising from your discussions in your room, and please put your room number and put those into the chat and the links for your rooms will come up on your screens. And then we'll be back here at 11.40 to um, raise the questions that, that you've brought up. Thanks very much, everybody. Brilliant, thanks very much, everybody. So there was some great um, questions came up in the chat when Nora was speaking to us, but again, if you, the rapporteur could add to the chat any points or comments that you have that you'd like me to raise with Dr. McRae, that would be brilliant. But I suppose, Nora, if you don't mind, just to kick it off, a, a comment that came in from Geraldine O'Neill when you were speaking, is in relation to any feedback that there's been whoa <laughs> the, the comments are flying in i lost the top one um sorry nora if there's been any feedback across canada or internationally on the value of having an agreed set of will types and if so what has that feedback been so with respect to the question the feedback has been we we started this process and and as you can imagine any of you i don't maybe none of you have had this experience of being in a higher education committee that goes on for about two years discussing the meanings of this and that. But maybe this is a uniquely Canadian thing, but anyhow, um, we started this process in the province of British Columbia, which is on the west coast of Canada, and we, and we figured out the types there. And then we took it across to the rest of Canada, and there was a lot of, you know, arguing about this and that. But at the end of the day, we basically came up with 
the same sorts of buckets as we call them. So we call them buckets so that people don't feel too constrained within each type. Uh, and then that's been very, very useful to us across the, the country. Uh, because now we feed that into, we have a, a very strong relationship with our federal government that has been extremely supportive in supporting work integrated learning with um, incentive programs to employers, uh, which have been really important during COVID to help uh, keep employers hiring. And it's been very important to lay the foundation for all sorts of things that we do across the country now. So I would say it's been extremely positive. We have taken this framework to and I'm not sure, I thought I would mention actually to this group, there's the World Association, WACE, W-A-C-E, the World Association of Cooperative and Work Integrated Education. And that association has um, international gatherings. And there's a large contingent, um, especially I would say from Australia that are very interested in assessment. And uh, you may, some of you may wanna connect in. Um, I'm now part of the group that's running that association. We're planning a virtual conference in May. And there's always, interest in assessment and quality and how we how we move forward. So the Australian group, for example, um, oh, and I see Rola is here from Deakin, so you're probably very aware of this, um, also came up with a quality framework and also have been looking at different innovative types of will and how that connects in. And so we've taken the Australian work and we've seen, okay, how do these innovative models, how are they different? Should we be rethinking our approach, our framework, and actually find that the innovative models fill, fit within our buckets already. And so that's, that's a really good um, check. So I, I would say it's been something that's really enabled conversations across many jurisdictions and um, really, really helps to bring sense to the conversation or else my experience is that you can spend, you know, the first 90% of the conversation arguing about what you're talking about instead of actually getting down to what it is you need to talk about. Great, right. thanks, Nora. So some interesting questions coming in, but I suppose, um, Catherine Murphy, you raise a very interesting one about uh, training for the workplace assessors. Would you like to ask Nora a little bit about that, Catherine? I don't mean to put you on the spot. Thanks very much. Yeah, I would be interested in hearing what expertise or, or what's best practice they have developed. I think it's probably opened up a little bit more in terms of how we think about training workplace supervisors, as we call them now, um, given that we're doing so much more online, but I'd be interested to hear what Nora ha has come up with already. Mm -hmm. And just so I'm just going to check my understanding by workplace supervisors, it would be the actual employer in the place of business or the host organization. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. okay. And I would say this is an area that always needs improvement because, you know, as you know, there's so many different kinds of them and they come from such different backgrounds and we don't have the same level of um, uh, jurisdiction over them that you would over your own staff or your own faculty, right? Um, so what we do is a very uh, kind of soft approach. You know, here's a supervisor's handbook. Here's what we're trying to accomplish with assessment. Here are different ways that you might do it. Here are the guidelines around um, fairness and accountability, that kind of thing. This is and also an explanation of what we're going to do with the assessments. In the case of the University of Waterloo, this is very important because the evaluation an employer gives a student shows up on their record. So if an employer gives a student a very good, then the next time they're applying for a job, the very good shows up on their record and, and the next employer gets to see it. So there's a, there's a big impact. If that employer you know, decides that the student has done poorly, that, that is really has a huge impact on the student. So we want to make sure that to the extent we can, but with those provisions, Catherine, that you know, we, we can't necessarily control what they're going to do because they are independent operators, which makes work integrated learning you know, tricky in that regard. So we do have checks and balances. Um, if an employer, say there's, or, or a host organization um, decides they don't like a student for a particular reason, then uh, we have a way of moderating that evaluation or coming in and making sure that that is not the end of the story, that we have a process to, to protect the student effectively. And, and especially if there, if there could be any allegation that there's something that's not equitable or there's something that relates to racism or or sexism or anything like that we want to make sure that the student's protected and that's number one 
Great, Nora, thank you. So look, I'm very conscious of time, but I'm going to ask one more question, which I think sums up what a lot of the groups were asking. And it's from Mandy in room 15. And it's about the students in terms of preparing them for work experience, in terms of the culture of work, the behaviours, and really the readiness of students um, for Will, if you wouldn't mind, Nora. Thank you. And thanks, Mandy, for that question. And what do we do about it? Is that the preparedness? OK. Yes, yes. All right. Um, so we have a very, uh, a very extensive unit called our Work Integrated Learning Programs Unit, and they're responsible for the curriculum or the pedagogy to prepare students before each experience. We have a whole um, set of professional development courses that students have to take during their work experiences, and then there's, um, there's programming that happens after. With respect to preparing, every student must successfully complete the first preparatory course, and these are, these are for credit. Um, and if they don't prepare, if they don't successfully complete it, they don't go out in their first work term. So that's that's how that works. Um, and we have that across the board. So everybody has to do it. And, and within that, you've got the usual types of, of uh, subjects, right? You know, how how understanding the, the nature of the world of work, understanding oneself and motivation and then different techniques, because ours is a highly competitive process. So they have to do CVs and cover letters and all that shenanigans and so it's it's getting ready for all of that so that they can they can do that and that's the bare bones now there are some students who that's more than enough and off off they go and then there are other students where that's not necessarily enough so for example in our undergraduate population about 20 percent maybe a bit more now are students who are international students so appreciating um the cultural values or the different cultural contexts of the Canadian workplace may be different from where they're from. So we have additional programming that's available and that's offered as well um, to students. And sometimes that's required depending on where they're coming from and what, I mean, where, where, what their challenges are. And sometimes it's just an array of options that they can take. And that, that carries on all the way through until they get that first work term and various interventions that escalate depending on where they're at. Great. Listen, Nora, thanks very much. It's been fantastic um, learning about your experience in Canada, certainly giving us all a lot of, of food for thought. And thanks to the uh, rapporteurs for bringing through your questions. I'll hand you back to the MC now. Thank you. So uh, we're back again um, for the uh, for module three. Um, and um, in this case, the um, module is going to be um, opened with a presentation from uh, Dr. Rola Ajavi uh, from the University of Australia uh, entitled What Makes for Authentic Assessment in Work Integrated Learning? And um, immediately after uh, Dr. Ajavi's presentation, um, Naomi Jackson, uh, who's Dean of uh, Academic Affairs at CCT College in Dublin, uh, will uh, facilitate the breakout sessions and the question and answer session afterwards. Um, so uh, uh, over to you, uh, uh, Rola. Thank you so much, Peter. I'll start by sharing my screen if um, that's okay. okay. Wonderful. So I hope you can see that. Um, so good morning, everyone. My name is Rola Jowie. I'm an associate professor at Cradle, which is the Centre for Research in Assessment and Digital Learning at Deakin University. Uh, I'll be talking to you about authentic assessment, in particular research we've been doing here at Deakin and at Cradle. I'd like to also start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land um, on which I'm based, um, and that is the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging. Um, so I'd like to uh, talk about authentic assessment. What makes for authentic assessment? I'm going to talk about um, some common frameworks, if you like, around authentic assessment, just to start with, and then go on to some research we did, which looked at student experiences of authentic assessment, or at least assessment within work-based placements. Um, and then I'm gonna offer to you a reframing of how we might think about authentic assessment that 
you may choose to consider perhaps in the breakout sessions and then finish on some practical suggestions for assessment design. Just to start with, um, here in Australia, we've adopted this particular definition around will, which I think comes from the work of Jan Orell originally. And that is that will is an umbrella term for a range of approaches and strategies that integrate theory with the practice of work within a purposefully designed curriculum. And what you notice here is that it is actually a quite a broad definition of will. So it's um, an attempt to be pragmatic, I suppose, and in terms of being able to integrate a lot of different experiences and opportunities. And much like you heard Nora present, um, actually with my talk as well, it, there's a lot of similarities that hopefully um, extending from where she ended is to look more at design in a more, in a more in a more micro level, I suppose. But just to start with, there's two assumptions, and I think the, we can all agree on these, especially because um, you've heard them already today, is that will activities are really valuable for learning, they are important for learning, and that assessment shapes learning. In fact, at Cradle, we talk about assessment having being a real moral act because it shapes who our students become and it shapes what we recognize as being valid knowledge. Um, in the discipline. And again, just to set the scene, um, you've heard already today quite a bit about how complex assessment is. Uh, Geraldine talked about the metaphor of shifting sands, which I really appreciated in terms of the context, the setting. And I've just listed here the three, the three key people I'm going to focus on in terms of stakeholders, the industry or workplace supervisor, the student and the university staff. Um, Recognising, of course, there are other key stakeholders as well, but these are the three, three main ones I'm going to talk about. So what do we know from the research on assessment design in will in particular because of this complexity and because of the broad range of different will experiences that are out there um, we tend to see a different slew or, or um, a different set of uh, assessment design strategies in will and these are the more more common ones I suppose you know there's often learning plans that I said at the beginning with some articulation of agreed goals between the three key stakeholders I've identified already um, there's often reflection on workplace activities and learning um, there might B plus or minus some artifacts from the workplace that are incorporated perhaps within portfolios, uh, such as lesson plans, for example, if you were in a teaching degree. Um, plus or minus assessment and feedback from industry supervisors um, and then project reports are another very common example of assessment design. And a really common way of thinking about authenticity in will assessment typically comes down to these two things and that is the represent the context the assessment sorry uh, represents the context or real life context um, of the workplace and this is on a continuum from low to high and um, it represents the key activities that a, a student might engage in in that particular workplace and so there's a, a level of authenticity there to the um, to the activity themselves. And, and you can see here an attempt to map out, so um, you can, as a staff member, it, it map out the level of authenticity on this continuum from um, low to high for these two particular criteria. And these are really the most common ways of thinking about authenticity. And I noticed these in your own documentation alongside actually some other um, identified features of authentic assessment, which you see here in the AAF, which is um, comes from work also here in Australia, and as well as recognising the proximity to the workplace and to the activities, it also um, authentic assessment is supposed to engage students in high quality cognitive engagement it should actually engage the student in reflexively evaluating performance. And this is work we have done, um, we've really put a bit of effort in into, into here at Cradle, is this idea of evaluative judgment is helping students understand what good looks like um, for the particular setting, for the particular work. It's kind of um, the, this idea that links in with, we've heard already, lifelong learning. Um, and we've called it evaluative judgment. 
Um, and that finally, industry contributes to assessment. Again, not a new idea there, but the, um, you know, you need to have all three three stakeholders involved. But what, what struck us actually from looking at the literature in more detail was this particular study. Um, and this is from Smith and Morsefold. And, and they talked about actually that they did some quantitative research and they showed a correlation between students' perceptions of alignment and authenticity in assessment as being the strongest contributor to attainment of will outcomes and that influences their engagement and therefore learning from will. And why this struck us in particular is that notion of alignment, because before, you know, in the two frameworks I've showed you already that talk about authentic assessment, actually there wasn't really a lot of mention of alignment in the sense of aligning goals, activities and assessment design. But beyond that, um, it was the student's perception that mattered. And that really got us interested because um, what we saw in the previous uh, research was a lot of attempts at staff mapping out authenticity and, and not to say that that is incorrect, but what is the student, whose view of authenticity matters um, when you do have so many stakeholders and we got interested in the student view um, as a gap in the literature and so um, just, uh, also just to highlight this idea of alignment, which I've already explained. Um, what, what struck us as well is that if we go back to Biggs's original definition of constructive alignment, it's something the learners have to create for themselves. That tends the constructive part of it. And so, yes, it's really important that we um, do our mapping of our curricula and we, we um, do these maps to identify alignment in our assessment, that our assessment actually is assessing our learning activities and our learning goals, but it's not enough and, in, and the students need to be able to see the alignment themselves. And so we got interested in this and we asked the question, what does assessment in will capture in terms of learning goals and learning activities? You know, do the students see will assessment as being aligned and authentic to their placement? Um, and this was work that was funded by ASIN, the Australian um, Collaborative Education Network, who is our national body for will. Um, and so alongside a number of alignments, we actually identify both alignments and misalignments in the way students perceived assessment. Um, and I'll show you some of these findings now. Um, I should have said, actually, the way we did this research was we interviewed students across two universities and we asked them to draw. First, we asked them to draw um, what they learned from the will placement. And then with a different color, we asked them to um, highlight to us what of their achievements were actually captured through assessment. And that was our attempt to try and really work out this idea of alignment. And then, so once they did this drawing, we asked them to talk us through the, um, the drawing. And also we had some, um, some structured interview questions as well. So coming back to the alignments and misalignments, and you might be wondering, you know, this is a talk about authenticity. Why is she talking about alignment? And that is because I'm going to get to the point where I'm going to suggest to you that actually students' perceptions of alignment really matter to authenticity. And that's what this research really showed us. Um, so the key misalignments were between assessment activities and students' perceptions of their future selves, between placement activities and assessment activities, and between university and in industry roles um, and practices. And I'm going to talk about each of these individually now. So the first layer of misalignment or alignment, um, I mean, not, it wasn't entirely misaligned. There were lots of alignments, but there were um, misalignments that we saw as well. And the first one is around that idea of assessment activities and future selves. And so um, the value of will assessment for the students, the way they oriented to will assessment was that it oriented to their future selves. So it was, why will was really valuable and useful to them was because it actually got them to have a go at being this future professional 
that they're trying to become and to play out that um, role, if you like, and, and to see how their developing identity is going. But the issue with assessment is assessment by its very nature tends to put students back into their student role. Um, and that's because assessment serves multiple purposes in itself. There's a tension there because, you know, we saw that assessment for learning can be in tension with assessment of learning. Um, and I think for me, the way I think about assessment design, it's always a set of um, compromises as Geraldine noted initially, you know, you com might compromise um, reliability, if it's a low stakes, for example, uh, assessment for learning being your primary purpose, whereas if it's a high stakes summative assessment, you might not want to compromise on reliability or consistency, if you like. But then you, what you do is you compromise on validity. Um, so, um, so another key of misalignment, so the misalignment here was if the assessment didn't actually um, feed into the students in learning goals, uh, or, you know, it didn't really tap into what their goals were for that particular placement. And so you might say, well, actually, a lot of our students have learning contracts as their first assignment, usually when um, even, you know, we saw this in our own research, the first assessment was very much typically a learning plan or a learning contract where students, industry and staff got to input in some way or somehow look at this learning contract and, and come up with a shared understanding for the placement. But um, where the misalignment happened, although that's the starting point, it was often not revisited during the placement. And so you got to the end of the placement and the goals may have shifted, but nowhere along the line could the student actually um, take care of that until right at the end when it might have been too late. Um, and what you see in this quote here is one of the students talking about, uh, let me shift this here. I felt this was actually a really positive um, quote around the ways that assessment positioned them as a developing, as someone who's becoming a professional. I felt the assessments, they were just really more industry-based assessments. So they're really relevant to who I wanted to become. There's actually stuff that we can go out and use ongoing beyond our degree, the resume, even the journal document stuff, working with in clients, their actual industry related skills. Um, so moving on from here, and this is this is part of the drawing, and it's just a bit of um, you know just to show you a little bit about how the student once this particular student conceptualized her placement. You know the the purple is the the activities that she was doing and how she was working with animals and 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 working with different people and 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 building surveys as part of her placement and then when it came to the assessment it was very much about um her professional development um and and personal professional development so uh but it was about her as a student so moving on to the next one and i think this one is probably a little bit clearer to get your head around which is the misalignment between placement activities and assessment activities um, where we saw good alignment was performance-based assessment. This is typical more of the health professions, for example, which is my background. I'm a physio by training um, and I used to be a clinical educator. Um, but in the, these are the tightly coupled and the more loosely coupled uh, uh, types of placements. Uh, there we saw that typically assessment really assessed a very narrow range of competencies. So they might have had a really wide range of competencies that they learnt in the placement, but assessment was typically written or reflective written and um, measuring, you know, a very narrow genre. So the students didn't feel like, feel like it really showcased their achievements and who they were becoming. And, and this led to instrumentalism. It became just another tick box that the students had to do. Um, 
And this is a quote from a student saying, the rubric for my assignment is very much focused on our understanding of the structure of a lesson plan and what needs to be in a lesson plan to teach an effective lesson, rather than how actually personally I taught it and how we find the less pound, the lesson plan either stayed the same or changed during the lesson. And actually, I thought this was really insightful on behalf of the students. And, and that is because what the student realized is it was important that they did, this was a teach, they were in a teaching degree, um, Another example of what I would call a tightly coupled placement, because often these, these placements have regulations um, and competency frameworks. But the assessment was focused on the formal lesson plan and then reflection on enactment of the lesson plan. And you might think, well, what's the problem there? But what this student identifies is actually there were situated contingent enactments that had to happen because of the particular situation in the classroom that really was never captured in the assessment in a live way. Um, and I thought that was really interesting. And here you see another example of the way that assessment captures a narrow range of competency. So what you see here is a student, the blue is all the activities they did in their placement. Uh, they answered the phone, they did email, they worked in teams, they did went to meetings, et cetera, et cetera. And yet the assessment is very much about a written, a written task that was, um, I think there was a mid-placement mid communication review and then um, a final um, report. So that, that, you know, I'm not, um, what I'm saying, what I'm showing you here is that, yes, this assessment does capture important things. I mean, these are things that were achieved, but it is a narrow range. Um, and final, finally, it was there is a misalignment between what, what happens at university, the practices of the university and industry practices. And so there was a mismatch between what they were taught at the university and how it was practiced at the workplace. Um, and the learning regarding local enactments and variabilities of practice were not capitalized on. Assen assessment was mostly university driven and this led to cynicism because the students felt that um, the role of the supervisor in the workplace wasn't really being um, adequately um, given the regard it should be because they are, those, the industry is the real world, not the university. Um, and so what's interesting here for me is that, um, that of course the, you know, there will be gaps between the practices in the university and the practices in a workplace. They have different purposes. Um, and the question I'm, I would get curious about here is why might that be the case? And to get students to think about how the difference in context might lead to different practices. Um, in terms of the role of the supervisor, uh, a lot of the assessments we saw because of the issues of consistency, and I completely get this, I get there is research that shows that typically workplace supervisors tend to be more lenient in their marking, and that's work by Denise Jackson uh, and colleagues. Um, but it comes back to that quote Geraldine had. So what, what we do to deal with that is we say, okay, well, supervisors can give feedback and they can rank rate, you know, on a rating scale at the end, but we'll call it a hurdle. So it's only pass and fail. And then the report is what we get marks for. And so you can see how this devalues whether the, the information that the supervisor gives in the eyes of the student, because in the university, it's the marks that matter. Um, and, and you see this in this quote, the way we're taught to document here at uni and, and they go out into the workplace, it's like not necessarily the same at all. That's the issue of the difference in practice. So that's frustrating when you're getting assessed at uni but, and you've got to tick these boxes, but it's like, that's not even the way they do it in real world. Um, a lot of my research is in medical education and, and uh, there's been a big push for national competency frameworks, which really act to coordinate between university and what's happening in the workplace through the language of the standards. But the 
assessors don't necessarily, the workplace supervisors don't necessarily understand that language. It doesn't speak to them and what they do on a day-to-day -day placement in, in, the, in the workplace. And so it becomes detached from the day-to-day -day, and then it's merely a tick box exercise for the university to get done. And that also leads to cynicism and instrumentalism. So I'm, I'm conscious of time and I wanna get to the reframing um, as I'm coming uh, towards the end of my time. So what does this add in terms of our understanding of authentic assessment? Firstly, that the alignment between the university industry and student needs needs to be seen as a component of authenticity. And this alignment should be striven for by the people who are designing the assessment. But beyond that, we need to help students see the ways in which they these things align. That placements were very much interactive, emergent, uh, diverse, but the assessment typically were done at a computer on their own, written and capturing their own competencies. The students want the assessment to reflect their achievements and their developing identities. And, and uh, this notion of developing identities is really important in other work that I'm doing um, is the idea of portrayal. Assessment needs to help students to portray their achievements, but also who they are becoming and to be able to strategically negotiate this portrayal for different audiences. And we need to start doing that early in the piece so that students are more comfortable about talking about who they are and what they bring and, and, and who they are becoming. Um, and that misalignments that we saw are symptomatic of the lack of coordination between university and industry leading to inauthentic representation of learning. And I'll say something here that I don't want to, I think there was a lot of effort that went into a lot of these designs and there were good things about them. Um, but when rubrics and materials and artifacts of assessment are unilaterally designed by the university and handed over to industry and said, here you go, um, that's not really collaborative and that doesn't foster shared understanding between the key stakeholders. The other point here is about misalignments being opportunities for learning. So for example, um, you know, there might be reasons you might do things differently in the workplace to how you learned at the university. And that is an opportunity for a conversation about the influence of context and, and how, why there might be those differences. It's not to say one is better than the other. It's just to say that there might be differences that, that matter and are situated. So here's a bit of theory that we started to think about in terms of assessment. And this comes from communities of practice theory, originally Laban Wenger, then Wenger um, took it on. And, 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 and what it's saying is that um, assessment needs to act as, in, in a more simple term, is that assessment needs to act as a bridge between the practices of the university and the practices of industry. And, and the key person here that matters is the student who tries to, to who goes between these two practices. Um, and so we term them the broker, but assessment as a boundary object between these two practices needs to be true, needs to have components of the university practices as well as components of the industry practices. And that's where the collaboration really matters and getting student involvement really matters. So what does that mean in perhaps more simple terms is if we think about assessment as a boundary object, then it needs to coordinate between university and practice and the students are the brokers who are coordinating this activity and therefore making meaning between the two communities while constructing their professional identities. And so their, um, their input as well as their developing understanding about the assessment and what they are achieving really matters here. So authentic assessment needs to create space for this negotiation of meaning among stakeholders. Um, how might we do that? How might we encourage these constructions of alignment? Um, that's opening up opportunities for students in negotiating assessment tasks 
and fluidity in revising learning plans, for example, or revising assessment tasks as and when things change in the placement. Um, is to encourage students to, and to give students that um, power, if you like, isn't the right word, but the, um, give them the, the ability to, step, to seek feedback and to speak up and say, you know, maybe this assessment isn't really going to work for this. Um, is to encourage students to reflect on the misalignments as actual opportunities for learning. Um, and to think a bit more about how we might assess performativity and portrayal that privileges their developing professional identity. Um, the work of Vu, uh, sorry, Dalalba, Gloria Dalalba from the University of Queensland says that um, we, we have often privileged epistemology, epistemology in assessment, i.e. knowledge. Um, we need to also start to privilege ontology the, the who this, the person is and what they bring and who they want to become to make something authentic, you need to have both. And so the question here is how do we make things better? This is my last slide and I'm, I'm sorry, I realize I've gone a bit over. Um, so some practical suggestions. If employability is dynamic and adaptive and work certainly is, how can assessment emulate this? And so these are just some suggestions, maybe some three way feedback conversations might be um, one way of doing it. And in other work that I do uh, is a lot of feedback research. And uh, I'm often asked when I talk about feedback is, you know, how, this is very time consuming, how do we do this? And so my argument is that, yeah, we're all time poor, how do we optimize the learning in the time that we have and maybe spending 20 minutes writing feedback at the end of a unit on a report where the student has already moved on to the next unit of study isn't the best time spent for of that 20 minutes and maybe we can front end that and make that a shared conversation about excuse me evaluative judgment and helping students understand what does good look like in this workplace? What does this standard look like? Um, excuse me, one second. And maybe some more agile forms of assessment that promote student choice of portrayal. Audio diaries, for example, could be a really good way of capturing students' day-to-day -day experiences. Perhaps there might be opportunities to record some performances in the workplace and have a commentary about them and how those, what the meaning that students are making about these in, in, uh, activities, involvement of industry in unit review, assessment and moderation. Assessment and feedback literacy is something we're really working on and that's the idea that we need to help students and industry and everyone um, understand the purposes of assessment and feedback more deeply. And then finally, ask students about their experiences of alignment and authenticity. That's the way to find out if and whether your assessment is authentic. So this is the paper the work I've just presented comes from, and this is a guide that's freely available that we wrote that looks at, it sets out a set of principles that we think really matter for authentic will assessment. We also have some case studies and we talk about um, why these things matter and how we might enact them uh, in our modern workplaces. And these are my slides. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Rola. That was an extremely engaging and insightful um, presentation. And I'm sure I, I couldn't see any other faces on the screen, but I'm sure there were many nodding heads like my own um, and, and probably more than one light bulb moment. Um, some very interesting uh, feedback from the student research that you did there as well. Um, we will be going into breakout rooms now. So just to go through the, the housekeeping of that, you'll be a link will appear up on the screen and you'll need to click accept. Um, and that will take you into your breakout room where you'll spend 15 minutes discussing what this means for policy and practice. 
Um, and if you could each um, identify, each breakout room identify a rapporteur who will put the breakout room number and any key points from your discussions into the, the chat box, we can then um, come back together in the main room and, and share those thoughts and summarise them towards the end. So um, if I could just remind everybody, whoever the rapporteurs were, to put their summary notes and, and uh, room number in the chat. Um, and in the meantime, I will just hand back to Roller to um, discuss some of the questions and comments that came in during the presentation. Um, Geraldine O'Neill, you had a question relating to whether context impacts on misalignment. I don't know whether you want to add something to that question for Rola. Hi Rola, how are you doing? It's Geraldine here. <laughs> um, I hope I'm not hogging the floor with all the questions, but I'm really interested in, 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 in your talk. Um, I suppose what I was particularly interested about is like um, Nora was talking earlier about contexts and different contexts, like there's internships and clinicals and these different types of one. And I did wonder, was there more of a misalignment for the students who were in the ones, the type of contexts that are assessed more by educators than those that have more assessed by employers, practitioners, whatever you want to call them. So is the context, is that misalignment more severe in some contexts? Yeah, thanks, Geraldine. Uh, yes, so we saw more misalignments in the loosely coupled placements than in the tightly coupled placements. So if you think about nursing or education or, you know, teaching, for example, those sorts of um, highly regulated, what Anne-Marie talked about, um, where you've got national competency frameworks, those things act as coordination. There's accrediting bodies. Um, and there's a strong vocational view. So the idea that the student can see what they're doing in the, in the placement, um, really contributing towards who they are becoming. And often these assessments tend to be work-based um, and heavily supervisor driven. And, and so, so these actually were better aligned for the most part than the loosely coupled contexts that were often um, reliant on, say, a report, a, a learning contract at the beginning and then a report at the end. Uh, but because there was so much allowance for variability in the placement, um, the report often was, it, the feeling was it was really um, more of a tick box exercise about, you know, reflecting. And I was actually speaking with someone in our breakout room, reflective reflective assessments are good for what they are in terms of they show that someone can reflect at least according to a model in a written format. What they don't show is that they can do the thing. It shows that they can talk about the thing. And it's not, that's not the same thing. Um, so how do we capture the performance as well as the reflection of the performance? So to, the short answer is yes, it does. There are differences in context. Thank you. Thanks for that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and um, at somebody else, F. Murphy, I don't know, sorry, I don't know who F. Murphy is, but you, F. Murphy asked whether Young's personas agreed in advance by the three partners would provide exemplars of the behaviours and skills that will be assessed. Would that be a means of being able to do that? It's not how I'm using the term persona. I'm using the term persona. Um, it comes from persona studies, which um, is from celebrity studies actually I recently gave a talk about what we can learn from Kim Kardashian um, and that's because the way I'm talking about persona is these are strategically constructed by the student they're strategically constructing their persona to a particular audience um, and it's kind of a bit like identity but it's more fluid and emergent and constantly being constructed and why did I bring that up is because something to be authentic, it needs to bring the whole person in and it has to uh, tie in with their goals and how they are developing. And um, assessment needs to offer an opportunity to do that, I suppose. Uh, so from, I don't actually know, John, I'm a physio. I don't really, I'm, I'm not a psychologist, but um, I, wouldn't see the way I use persona as particularly related to behaviours in any archetypal way. 
Sorry, that was my question, Naomi Finbar Murphy. Um, I was doing it in the context of when um, Rola was talking about how they portray themselves, and that might be they portray themselves at the beginning of the process and at the end of it. But if they were told at the beginning by co-constructing with the university, the in, uh, industry representation and themselves, they'd be able to well, they'd navigate their way to that end outcome. That's where I was thinking. So when you put the personas of you know, the entrepreneur, the you know the caregiver, the like within different contexts, they may prove quite useful. I, I've seen them in the past in social contexts, but like um, I suppose in business contexts, they, they could be used as well. They're the only two contexts I've ever seen them. That's I never thought about Kim Kardashian actually when I was typing about it. Well, Shut up. <laughs> um, you know, it, yeah, so I, I think this something, if, if I could rephrase that just a little bit, perhaps it is about helping students to have a go and try it on really about what it might look like to be someone in that industry who's employed and, and, and having a go, whether it's in an entrepreneur real way or whether it's in in a business way or in a nursing way um we we learn to become and 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 because assessment has such an important uh, important influence on learning um seems wasted to me that it spent ticking boxes really um just to ensure that we feel comfortable in the university that it is um consistent and reliable. I think there might be some other things that matter, not all the time, but maybe when we think about programmatic assessment and getting lots of data points on students across a program of work that some of them do need to be really high stakes and some of them um, need to be more about showcasing what the student can do and what makes them distinctive. Thanks, Rola. And I think that fits very well with what you outlined at the start of your presentation about assessment being um, a moral act, you know, and about shaping the students for who they will become. Um, Sue Hackett, Sue has a question here. Sue, I don't know whether you want to come in yourself there about the uh, whether Rola has experience of, I'm losing the chat, the, the chat is going up at such a racing pace, um, experience of specific context that you may have seen workplace supervisors given an active and equal role in the development of meaningful assessment. Oh, that's a really good question. Um, have I seen it myself? Um, I can tell you what I know best, and that is in health. Um, for example, when we developed the national um, assessment for um, physiotherapy, the Australian physio, the APP, I think um, it's called, there's a really big consultation process that happened into uh, talking about the competencies and what these look like, what, what, what matters to the profession. Um, but beyond the words, um, there was a big consultation pro um, process around uh, what does this look like? Um, and so then there was moderation videos uh, that, that, that workplace supervisors would engage with um, and would talk about, you know, these videos that were created of pretend physio students doing various um, activities with patients and and then they would talk about, you know, what they would score them and why. And, and in those moderation activities, you come to learn about the standards and there's a better shared understanding of what this words on a page mean. And, and, and so the assessment task itself then became standardised in the sense that all universities across Australia had to adapt, adopt, sorry, this um, particular tool. Uh, Look, it's not without its problems, even with all the investment that um, health puts into training their uh, clinical supervisors, it, it still there are probably consistency issues, but I'd say it's better. Um, and that actually there are some really good things around feedback that have been built into that process 
and and because you uh, trained and assessed in it as a student, when you become a supervisor or even just an, a, a, a physio in, in the end, um, you kind of have internalized some of it and you know the language of it. But to be honest, uh, because I'm a full-time researcher now, I uh, don't get to see a lot of the practice, but um, it would be really interesting to know if there is anyone here who does do that really close collaborative work between industry and university. Thanks, Rola. And um, I suppose there's so many comments coming through. There's one thing that I can say is that you certainly triggered great discussion in the breakout rooms. Um, I wouldn't even attempt to try and summarise all of what's there, but it's clear that a lot of people are agreeing that it's very easy to identify the misalignment. Now, some of that is as a result of it now being pointed out, but I think in many instances, it's people who are aware of it themselves. Um, and the real questions that we now need to ask and answer are how we get to moving from that space to where we want to be and where students are more active in their learning and how we engage um well i was going to say all three partners in the creation of that assessment but actually some of the suggestions coming through are also that we need a fourth partner where there is um, a regulator involved as well so um looking at how we can expand it out from that um, and I think probably we, we could have a whole new seminar just on, on that discussion alone. Um, but I think I'm conscious of the time and everyone else has done so well to keep to the time. I'll do my best now to follow suit. So I'll hand back over to you, Peter. And thank you very much, Rola. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, Naomi and, uh, and Rola for a really fascinating uh, set of presentations. And it's, it's great to see the, the volume of rich ideas coming through in the chat um, and indeed I'd like to thank all the presenters from this morning uh, uh, for, 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 for the really high quality of presentations. We're going to take a break now uh, for lunch um, so it uh, will be back here at, uh, let me get this right, um, 13.30 so it's, it's 12.52 now, we're back here at half past one or 13.30. Um, and uh, enjoy the music, enjoy the lunch. Okay, well, uh, welcome back. I hope you've all enjoyed your lunch and that uh, uh, beautiful music. Um, I'd like to uh, uh, launch module four, um, and this is uh, going to be uh, kicked off by an assessment, uh, a presentation from uh, Dr. Mary Kelly uh, from uh, Hibernia College in Dublin. Uh, entitled Reimagining the Assessment of Placement in Initial Teacher Education. And immediately after uh, Mary's presentation, uh, David Deneef, who's the Registrar and Vice President of Academic Affairs at IT Carlo, will, uh, will facilitate uh, the uh, breakout session and then the questions and answer sessions uh, after that. So uh, I'd hand over now to uh, Mary. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you very much, Peter, uh, for inviting me along today, and, and thank you for this morning's presentations. It's been very, uh, very, very interesting. So this afternoon, I suppose what I would like to present to you is a, a case study of professional competence and the assessment of professional competence in a program of initial teacher education. So in preparing the screens to, or the slides today, I was mindful uh, that, you know, and we talked about it this morning, that professional uh, programs are often easier maybe to assess because you have the, the regulatory body uh, and the, the conditions that they sometimes put in place. So I, I suppose I really wanted to draw out the wider kind of learnings and hopefully share and you can really, I suppose, use some of these in other programs as well. So just in terms of the, the structure of what I'd like to discuss is just, I suppose, to reflect on our understandings of what competence is in a professional work setting, to examine the various modes of assessment, to look at COVID and, and what it has posed for us, because it certainly has posed challenges for those of us who have been, you know, using uh, and used to working in the placement setting where now we have restrictions and uh, we've had to 
modify, we've had to re-envision, we've had to reimagine our assessments. And some of it, I think, has been very exciting. And I know those of us in teacher education may well keep some of what we've uh, learned in that. So I, I, I'd like to share those with you as well. And finally, I suppose we, we've talked a lot about it this morning as well, is to look at a reflective practice as a tool for the development of self-efficacy in professional agency. I suppose that's really what we're about in professional programs is graduating professional reflexive thinkers, people who have you know, problem solved, can, can communicate, can share their learned experiences and who can adapt and be reflective. Um, and, and I suppose, I think reflective practice can enhance and support the assessment of professional competence. So just looking at a way of defining it um, and, and what it means to us. Um, I think when we talk about professional competence, we're looking at two sets of capacities. We're looking at the knowledge and the skills that you need to do the job, but we're also looking then at the values and the dispositions. And it's when they come together that we really, I suppose, have a sense of somebody's professional capacity, somebody's ability to meet the demands of the profession. And really, I suppose professional competence is, is very much aligned to your professional identity. And that's what we're trying to do all the time. From the minute a student comes on a professional program, we're, we're trying to ensure that we grow and develop and sustain and nourish, nurture a professional identity. Because identity, and I've done quite a, a lot of study on this, it really, I suppose, it, it stands as the who, who we are, how we operate, what we understand our work to be. And it really is a certain kind of person in a certain kind of context. And it really defines, I suppose, identity defines where a person puts their effort, how they seek out professional development opportunities, and how they're going to grow in the future. Because I think we have to be mindful always that these are, you know, they're on a continuum, they're on a journey. And while we, we graduate the best we can, we also have to be mindful that we want these people to grow and sustain their growth. So we have to ensure that they, they bring with them that lifelong capacity to learn and develop and, and, and want to, um, to grow and become insightful practitioners who really can learn from the experiences they have. So it's important, I suppose, on a professional program then, that we really provide those authentic learning opportunities. And we spoke a lot about that this morning. What does that mean? You know, professional identity doesn't happen in isolation. We're all part of a, of a social world and we need to have those professional conversations with others. We need to grow. Our identity is not stable. It's not fixed. Just because I'm a teacher of this at this particular moment, that doesn't mean that the classroom will change, that policies will change. I have to be responsive. I have to be reflexive. I have to be able to grow and, and develop. And we need to, I suppose, bring students with us on that journey. We also talked, I suppose, this morning a lot about what students value on placements. And sometimes they go into a placement and what they've learned in, in the college or what they've learned on their academic program, uh, you know, it doesn't align with the experiences. And we're very mindful of that in, in teacher education, particularly. And I suppose Zeichner talked about how students' experiences are often washed out in, in the real world of the classroom. And a classroom is a complex place, no more than any professional setting. And students will come across challenges challenges and things that they haven't learned in their academic program. But what we're trying to do all the time is to align the theory and the practice, to give them the knowledge, uh, to give them the pedagogy, to give them the, you know, the, the experiences so that they can use them uh, in their situations. And we don't want, I suppose, technicians. That's what we don't. We don't want uh, people who just do the same thing. We want to have people who can reflect, who can research if something goes wrong, who can adapt, who can draw on different skills and different knowledge. And that's really important from the, from the program point of view and from the design of any program that when you're thinking about the professional placement, it's not an isolated module. It is a growth and a journey and, and you design the modules to bring and sustain the student to that place. So I suppose, as I said, in the professional context, we're always balancing the needs of the professional and the academic accreditation. And while it may kind of, I suppose, look sometimes like a luxury to have guidelines, to have criteria, to have it all set down, it, it also is uh, problematic in that it's high stakes for the student then. So if I take our own program, 40 of the 120 credits are given uh, and assessed on placement. So that's really high stakes. And we know sometimes then when they go out looking for jobs, that's the piece 
that maybe the employer looks to, how have they performed in the placement setting? So it's not always, uh, I suppose, as easy as it looks because it puts a lot of pressure on students then to perform in the workplace. And maybe they don't get those experiences that we'd love to have, those experiential ones where they can learn and develop because they are being assessed and they're under pressure to do very, very well. And they put themselves under a lot of pressure. So we really have to be mindful of that, I suppose, again, when we are preparing them and when we're out there assessing them. And I'll talk a little bit about that as we go on as well. So looking at a robust assessment uh, you know, program, how do we design that? Well, I suppose the one thing that I would say is that the learning outcomes must permeate all of the modules of the program, that the, it really is an integrated experience, that the work placement, the school placement in our context, is across all modules that we're 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 building and we're growing and we're continuously talking to students about that identity about what will happen when they're out and um, we also i suppose have to ensure that our assessment tools are, are fit for a purpose as well and, and i'll talk in respect of how we do that and that the the tasks are authentic we work with postgraduate students and we all know that they're very much I suppose, highly motivated. They know that there's a job at the end of it. They know that what they're going to be doing. And so they really want the task to be authentic in order to buy into it and in order to, um, you know, to, to, to really, I suppose, experience it. But we have to be mindful, I suppose, as, as academic uh, program designers here that you know, that they don't just get the, as I said, the technical apprenticeship bit, that they get the wider understandings, that they get the theory, that they don't just have the application and the knowledge in that respect. So if we look at the professional attributes of a teacher, and these could be applied across any profession, there's quite a lot there that you're actually trying to develop within one individual on a two year program, but also when you go out on, on placement and when you're out assessing students, how do you assess all of that in a meaningful way that is, uh, you know, that, that you can really stand over. And I think that consistency is absolutely crucial. And we spend a lot, a lot of time um, you know, training our tutors, talking to our tutors, we would have perhaps maybe in one year, we would have five different training sessions with, with our tutors to ensure that consistency. We're continuously talking and developing communities of practice. We're moderating, we're float visiting, we're, we're constantly checking to ensure that, that those are the, the real, I suppose, experiences that the students are all getting the same experience and the same consistent approach to it. If we look at placement itself, then what are we trying to do? Well, I suppose, you know, in any program, as I said, there's the knowledge, the skills, the competencies, the professional disposition, and that, that piece around personal identity too. So how do you manage uh, to assess all of the, you know, the things that you need, to, you know, this person needs to do in order to do the job, but then you're also trying to give them the opportunity to develop personally. And, you know, I suppose placement has been a, an integral part of the teaching profession for a long, long time. I, I remember back to being a 17 year old out in a school in Port Marnock, uh, and that's a long, long time ago. So we have been doing it. So, but how do you, I suppose now, where classrooms have become more yeah. complex, I think, and, and there's more diversity around, how do you allow a student to develop that personal identity and that personal growth? And I think that that's very, very important because we want to retain, you know, retention in a profession is very, very important too. I think it's really important to foster open dialogue too, and, and to acknowledge the huge role that those who are out in the workplace assessment or workplace learning environment have to support the student, um, other teachers, other principals, other people working in schools uh, and whatever uh, other settings that they really, you know, the chats are not the chats, they're professional conversations. And how do we value those professional conversations when somebody, a student turns to somebody and said, how might I have done that differently? Could I have done that? What happened with Mary? Why did she not learn that? Th that's really uh, open dialogue that we need to uh, value uh, and, and we need to, I suppose, recognize as how much it can contribute uh, to somebody's learning. 
And I suppose, you know, that, that relationship between the, the student teacher, the HEI and the school, that par partnership is absolutely crucial. And, and it helps, I suppose, a collaborative sense. And, and we're always looking for ways of collaborating with schools, of working with schools, of working with the, the professionals in those environments to support the, the journey of the, the student. So, I suppose I've just done some studies myself uh, and I asked our students just to rate uh, uh, of all the modules that they study on the program and there are 12 different modules to rate what they felt was the most valuable module and this was their number one and we're not surprised are we they love the placement they love being out because that's the job they came on that's what they wanted to do but I think it's really important to look at the words that they use it was the the real life experience the practical the insight the theory the realistic it was what they were, it was invaluable to them. It was beneficial. So we know that they like it. And I suppose then it behoves us all to design it in a way that really, really supports that because it is important to them and we're listening to their voices. So when we talk about, and uh, we talked this morning about, I suppose, the pair, the, the pedagogy, the preparation. In Hibernia College, this is how we prepare our student teachers. And, and it, we treat it like any other module that is really systematically designed to ensure that the student meets the learning outcomes and that they have success and that they know what the criteria around that is. So we live in a blended world um, and we would have on-demand sessions which are released and studied. We would have webinars and tutorials. We have online moderated discussion forums and the, I suppose the school placement forums are probably the most used forums we would ever have. Have. Um, they really students really really need support before they go on placement and these forums are run before they ever go out on placement so that they have some support and they have some of their questions and some of their their needs answered we have face-to-face -face days with them then where we meet them in the face-to-face -face world we have micro teaching and I think this is a, it's kind of a you know something that often was looked down on in, in, in teaching but where you have simulated practice where you set up a situation where students get to practice what it is to be a teacher um, and you know many of them are coming to us they haven't stood classroom they haven't maybe experienced even of communicating and, and teaching is all about communication so we give them an opportunity in a safe environment to practice with their peers to get feedback from their peers and to get feedback from a tutor uh, and to really I suppose get some sense of what it's like even just to physically stand up and have to deliver it so there that that has proved really beneficial um, and we often combine that then with our tutorials so that we can reflect back on them and what would they change and, and what would they do. And we do something as, similar, as simple as two stars and a wish uh, in terms of the student feedback. What did you like about it? What would you, what would you recommend? And then I suppose the placement itself, and um, they're usually six week periods and then there's one block which is 10 weeks uh, and, and the students are out in that. We also have, I suppose, uh, on our virtual learning environment, a, a really dedicated portal for school placement. We call it our school placement hub. And that's where we put everything. So our handbooks, our guidelines, our assessments, our any, any documentation that the student needs in relation to the, so that they have a repository, a place to go that they absolutely know has all of the information. Um, uh, and I suppose we, we put up resources, we put up FAQs, we up all, all the templates, if we have notices that we need to send, we communicate through our school placement hub very efficiently with the students and with our tutors across all of our modules so that everybody is clear what the expectations are and, and where they can go to look for them. We link in then with all of our, you know, our NCCA, any curriculum, any support documents, any of the, the work I suppose, that we would feel students might benefit, we put all of that up on in, in terms of resources. And again, it's really helpful for a student teacher to be able to go on and, and get it as a, at a, the touch of a button and, and have everything in, in a safe place. Then I suppose it, it's having those very definite um, assessment criteria so a student knows exactly what they're going to be assessed on um, and they're the I suppose the, the, the rubric that we use and their professionalism their planning their preparation because that's really important in a, an environment where they're going to have to be continuously so we value that and we we assess that and we, and we mark that obviously the quality of, of what they do out on the placement 
And I think I suppose maybe one to look at is their ability to reflect, but not just to reflect, it's to adapt. So after each lesson, they actually have to say, what would they do differently? And they write that down for us. So it's it's not just the, the loose sense of, of, tell us what you thought about the lesson. It's actually, I suppose, prodding them a little bit more to say, well, how would I have done it differently? And, and that really makes them think about their resources or their approach or their methods or whatever they use within the classroom that will uh, allow them, I suppose, to grow. And that, that's where the personal growth can really come on and can really be seen. And, and you'd see that in the difference between, you know, a, a student who is simply describing a lesson as a somebody who's interrogated their practice and, and actually knows how to, to develop it. So we use a range of different uh, assessment methods. Portfolios are wonderful, you know, for students to actually showcase their resources, their lessons, their artifacts that they've done within the classroom, photographs, videos, um, really important for them to have a repository, a safe place to, to say, well, look, this has been my 10 weeks here uh, and look at it. It's not just the visit that you came on. It's a total uh, total look across my, my 10 weeks and how I've developed. I'll, I'll leave the tutor visits for just one moment. We use a lot of reflective learning and reflective logs, uh, reflective commentaries where we guide them and we might put up an article or we might put up a suggested that they look at something and then they reflect on that so that they're get, we're really, I suppose, develop them. We talk a lot about reflective practice, but we actually have to teach students how to reflect. It's not something I, I think that's necessarily intuitive. Um, and we, we use multimedia audio presentations as well, where we ask them to design things, artifacts and, and resources that they're going to use in the digital world in the classrooms, and they have to present those. So we use a, a wide range of assessment methods. And if you think about it, if we just kept the assessment of you know, 40 credits to just visits, it, it would be uh, very, very stressful for students. So we, we like to kind of well, spread and, and have different modes of assessment so that they can uh, show us in various ways how they have developed. In terms of the actual visits, I, I, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that. So before any student goes out, we have what's called a virtual visit. So we go online, they upload uh, maybe a lesson plan or resource, and they get feedback on it before they're ever out in, in a room. So it, I suppose we're, we're staging it. We have a pre-supportive, uh, and, and this is non-graded feedback, where we sort of say, well, look, you might want to look at this, you could look at this. Um, we then go out and we have our face-to-face -face observation visits. And we always use two, two, two tutors assessing so that no one per student is just seeing one person. Um, and we have, after the, the supervisor has seen the, the lesson, they then meet with the student immediately after that. They sit with the student and they have a very reflective discussion. And I suppose it's that you know, dialogue framed by the theory of action is how I would put it. That it's, it's a real mentoring, coaching, um, balance between assessor and the coach and, and the pastoral side and it works very very well whereas you know where somebody is in situ at the moment in time able to reflect uh, and able to discuss and, and able to have a real conversation with the student as to, to where they look they get written feedback and what we've introduced very recently, which we have found is very powerful, is we ask the student to respond to the, the written feedback. So when the tutor posts the, the written feedback on the VLE, the student then has to respond and say, well, what are the two things that they you know, would agree with or what would they might do different? Because sometimes we found that in that post feedback, the student is so maybe nervous, uh, stressed, uh, feeling a little bit anxious or feeling, oh my God, I've just had a visit, absolutely, that they don't always take everything in uh, as you might expect them to. So we have that, that process where, and they can also then ask the tutor, well, what do you mean by that piece of feedback? I'm really not sure. I know you talked to me about it. So it doesn't end with the conversation and it doesn't end with the grade. And I suppose that, that's just a, a look at our, our form. So we have the strengths of the student teacher and then the aspects for the improvement for the student teacher. And the visit is either satisfactory or unsatisfactory. Um, and if the student has an unsatisfactory visit, then we send out a mentor. 
So again, a non-graded visit where somebody goes in and just supports the student through the process again um, and gives them, I suppose, the, you know, the, the, the confidence to go again and to pick it up again and, and to work really hard at, at improving it. So there's a real, I suppose, you know, balance between uh, the assessment and being supportive and growing somebody because we all know, I, I mean, not you know, as a teacher yourself or as, as somebody, things can go wrong, lessons can go, but it's how I adapt, it's how I react, it's how I reflect on it, and what I do differently the next time that can actually make me even a better person, a better teacher. So we're really trying, as I said, to develop the student for the long-term career, not just for those isolated assess visits that become too high stakes for them. I think there are different ways, and uh, I talked about, you know, different ways of having uh, th those uh, conversations and what you're trying to do, I suppose, is, is to co-construct knowledge with the student the whole time. And there are different frameworks that we use. Sometimes we use Bloom's taxonomy, you know, simply remember what did I do? Did I meet my objectives? And then to that higher level synthesis, analysis, evaluation, what am I going to do different? We also use Gibbs reflective cycle. And I suppose that's the piece, uh, you know, I talked about of actually modeling for students of what reflection looks like um, so that they can really interrogate their own practice. And over the course of the, the, you know, the program, the two year program, we build these up in terms of levels. We don't go out on the first block expecting that students can do all of this. But by the time they come to their final module, which we call our advanced model, we would expect that the reflexive, reflective student can do this in a meaningful way and, and can engage with these processes, having been taught, having been supported, having been mentored through the process over the two years. And I think that's really the success of, of any workplace environment is that having pastoral support. So our student support officer, we have a school placement coordinator, we have a head of school placement. Like we invest a lot of resources in the supports that we offer um, students so that they have contacts on, uh, and, and people to, to instantly call. So they can call anybody, th their own tutor as well, um, and have that pastoral support. The mentoring and coaching, uh, and as I said, we invest a lot of, lot of time in the training and coaching and mentoring of our mentors and coaches, of our school placement tutors is what we call them, so that they are able for uh, the role and that they're able to support our, our students. A lot of time, I suppose, in, in that structured dialogue, that observation, that that becomes a you know, a real experience uh, out in the school and that there is that co-construction, that development towards understanding uh, what has actually happened uh, and the reflective practice. And I think they they are the elements of, uh, you know, what we have learned over the last 20 years that when they're in place, the students can feel supported and they can grow and they can develop. Um, and as I said, you know, we've had, I suppose, you know, very much a face-to-face, school-based uh, setting. And now we're finding ourselves in a different uh, situation. We had students who we had to graduate who only got three of their 10 weeks um, placement last year. So we had to come up with very um, you know, sophisticated alternative assessments. And I think what we have done is we have um, developed our reflective discussions. They're now all online on Zoom. So the, the student teachers were able to talk through the lessons that they had developed, the resources that they had developed in those three weeks. And we were able to assess them in the same way in those reflective uh, discussions. We developed communities of practice with students as well. So each week we put up a question and we asked students to respond to, you know, to give four or five different uh, forum posts to that as well. And they got written feedback on it. So we've all had to develop. And I suppose the thing that the, the situation that we're now in is that we have students who are out on placement, but unfortunately the school placement tutors can't visit the placements because schools are, are obviously um, you know, not accepting visitors at the moment. So we now have a scenario where students have all of their lessons uploaded online and the uh, tutors are going in and having reflective discussions with the student on Zoom, teasing through how they taught it, how they used it, what they, you know, what the classroom management, what happened in this child, what, do, you know, all those kind of questions that you'd have in that post-reflection are all happening online as well. Um, 
And that's been uh, you know, challenging for us to train our tutors up um, and also to, to ensure that they, you know, the, the technology works and everything. But I think we've learned an awful lot in terms of how powerful those reflective discussions can be if they are teased out correctly and if there's guidance and if there, you know, people uh, are, are working through them. And I suppose, you know, finally, I suppose just kind of things to consider, you know, Quality learning occurs when there are diverse opportunities with appropriate mentoring, feedback and dialogue. And that's certainly our experience of what we have discovered. Assessors need to be carefully selected, trained and clear expectations on all sides. The importance of building effective partnership with HEIs and workplace. So our cooperative teachers who are out in our schools don't assess our students, but they are always asked by the school placement tutor how the student is getting on. We always seek their opinion. We always seek their professional judgment. They don't play a role in the actual formal assessment, but they certainly uh, you know, are a key partner in, in the whole process. And I suppose what we've learned is that assessment practices can ideally exploit the capacity of technology to promote it. The technology hasn't stopped us. In fact, in some ways, it, it often enhances it because you have a direct connection and, and you have instant access sometimes to, to tutors that you may have. So it's to look at how the technology can grow that, but I suppose also help you simply to manage the placement setting as well. But I suppose of all the things I would think it's that ongoing review and evaluation, drawing on the range of perspectives helping to ensure that it's a quality learning experience. That's really crucial. The surveying of students, the surveying of our tutors, the surveying of schools and principals, really ensuring that we are, you know, ad adapting, that we as a HEI are adapting to what is happening on the ground as well and what students are telling us. So hopefully that's just giving you some sense of, of a, a, you know, a, a practical way in how you can assess the placements um, in just in one particular context context so thank you very much Mary, thank you very much for that. That was absolutely excellent and really absorbing. And I just think while the focus was obviously on initial teacher education, it is such applicability across uh, a wide range of, of fields. Um, it was really interesting. Um, we now, uh, as we've done in the previous two modules, we'll now move to uh, move you again guys to the breakout rooms and again your focus questions will be in the breakout rooms uh, within the breakout rooms as you've done before if you can appoint a rapporteur and then we're asking you to come back with four or five short comments or points um, arising from your discussions within the rooms um, so if the rapporteur could bring that back and with on the feedback in the chat we can put your room number as and the well as the the four or five points to be really helpful there are a couple of other questions i know we've asked people to contribute on the chat as well there's a couple of really excellent questions there that maybe we'll post to mary once we've come back from the breakout rooms so thanks again mary and we look forward to your feedback guys in the breakout rooms and to answering more questions thanks very much yeah, we're, we're great to see everybody back. Um, I hope you had a, a good a good discussion there. I've we've asked you to put up uh, your feedback on the um, on the chat from each of your rooms if you've got feedback on that one. But we have a couple of questions, and I'm going to maybe uh, turn to Mary with one or two of them. Uh, one of the things that came up in in in. Uh, in the room I was in, Mary, was the, the question, what, what, how did COVID, what happened in COVID? Uh, and how, how, how did you adapt to, to reflect that different reality? Okay, so, so tradition, as I said, uh, in the COVID, um, there, were, there was two parts to COVID. There was the uh, prior to, um, I suppose, the June where student teachers actually, the, the whole block was canceled. And out of a 10 week block, they had actually completed three weeks of a block of placement. So uh, our students upload all of their resources, all of their lesson plans, everything online. So we had a repository, I suppose, of three weeks work. Um, and then we designed alternative assessments around those, um, what, what they had up. So we had uh, four online uh, reflective discussions with them where they have to choose uh, different lessons, talk us through the lessons, how they had taught them, what resources they had used, how the children had reacted to them, and what they would do differently now. 
um, they had to respond, as I said, to forum posts uh, and, and give examples, and they had to respond to each other's forum posts. So if somebody posted something, they had to show how they had also either reflected on that or added to it or, you know, disagreed with it. Um, and we had, um, so that, that was kind of one scenario. We have a scenario now, as I said, where the students are out in placement, but we as tutors are not able to be out. So again, we have the, the, the platform, the VLE platform allows us, so I could literally go into Hibernia now, go to Mary Kelly, who's down in Wexford, and know exactly what she has taught um, all day today. So we have a really good, rich repository of, of what they're doing because they upload everything that they have, all of their resources. And what we're doing then is, again, we have um, reflective discussions where they have a, a Zoom call with a school placement tutor. The school placement tutor asks them to take them through uh, the, the lessons for the day. And let's say, for example, it was an art lesson. And the, the tutor would then ask, well, show me what piece of clay they made. So the student has to bring examples of the work. They have to bring examples of uh, the, 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 what the children have done. They have to show their assessments, how they've assessed the work. So it's a really kind of, I suppose, a, a, you know, a, a, an interrogation. I, I was on one of them the, day, the other day and I thought, oh my God, this is like being interrogated by somebody. Um, but really, you know, very, very detailed uh, down to, you know, what a child X do and what a child Y do and what would you do differently? So that's really how, I mean, obviously observation is key and we'd love to be out in schools, but in the absence of that, that's one. And then the other piece I suppose that we're doing around it just to get a sense of the student is we're adding, a, um, one of the visits is where the student actually has to um, teach with their peers. So they're in groups of six and they have to present the lesson. So it gives us some sense of that student's presence, their communication, their questioning, all of those things. So we're having to balance uh, in a really difficult situation. And I suppose we, we need to um, be mindful that we want the students to progress and we need them to graduate, but we have to be able to stand over uh, the, the quality of them as well. So it, it, it's a real balance at the moment. It's very comprehensive, and that's something that a number of the questioners here have raised, is it's a very comprehensive, there's a lot of different assessments, a breadth of assessment methods being used across a, a variation in some settings, you know, um, with a lot of assessors and different teaching contexts. Um, and the question was raised is, how do you ensure coherence and consistency across that? One of the questioners here is raising the question about resourcing of that, that must take a lot of resources to do that one. Is there uh, do you have any comment yeah. on that? And I suppose it does. And, uh, you know, as I said in the group, you know, it, it is our bread and butter. It, it's what we have been doing for 20 years. So we have built up a lot of experience and um, we use um, you know, our, our, I suppose, adjunct faculty to as tutors, uh, and we do invest a huge amount of time and energy in the training of those people. We have the the, the templates, the resources, the, the frameworks. I've been on just last kind of Thursday and Friday. I, I myself just moderated about five of those calls. So we have that consistent quality assurance. If I had a you know difficulty with that. Um, tutor felt they would, you know, I would pick up the phone to them. We do a lot of that kind of individual um, training. Training is, is really key to ensuring, to, you know, and obviously you don't always get, it's not an exact science, but you do have to invest. We have the structures then, whereas as we have a head of school placement, we have a, a, an academic team, and then we have our adjunct faculty, and then we have a very, I suppose, you know, good administrative support and VLE support behind it. So it is it is resource intensive, but if 40 credits out of the 120 are, you know, um, assessed in this way, I suppose for us, we have to ensure that that quality is there. And we have to be able to stand over the program and stand over what we're doing and know that, you know, um, like the, what, the, the students who are graduating are fit for the role and, and are good and, uh, you know, and we want them to be the best teachers they can be. So I suppose that that is a drive. We're, we're passionate about that. Yeah, one of the things that I, I picked up, Mary, in your presentation was this training of tutors and you threw it in as one line. I was just wondering in terms of uh, how do you do it? What does that involve? Is that is that a challenge? Has that been a challenge to get people to a point to be able to assess? Um, not not hugely. So in the main, um, 
we obviously we invest in the recruitment of them so we interview everybody um we in the main we use people who have been teachers um in fact 100 all of them are, have been um teachers we bring them together so we in any given training session we will go through feedback forms we will ask them to you know mark the feedback forms we might show them a video student teacher ask them to grade the student we have a lot of i suppose community of practice reflective discussions we um go through we we spent a lot of time around the, the feedback so you know people sometimes can loosely write you know a very good lesson now if a student sees very good lesson they're expecting a grade in the 70s and um, so we really worked hard on making sure that they use the language of grade descriptors that they understand the the learning outcomes that they understand what we're looking for so we have a whole we we have a tutor placement handbook um, so within of those criteria that I showed you, professionalism, planning, preparation, we have those broken down in detail as to what somebody would expect to see in all of in a very good student, in a good student, in a satisfactory, in a non-satisfactory. So we've done a lot of work uh, around defining and, and trying to, I suppose, put uh, all of those things in a comprehensive way that somebody really can pick up and say, you know, yes, that's what I saw. Um, and we we give feedback to people if we you know when we're moderating if we get to come across feedback forms that have you know used excellent 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 and the students got 50 we will go back to that tutor and say look you know you need to use like so we've a lot of toing and froing a lot of work with our our tutors to ensure that um and i think it's really important to invest in that because that you know it lessens appeals it lessens reviews it lessens the the students and and, and you don't get it all right because obviously it's a, it can be a subject subjective experience but we try to make it as evidence-based as we possibly can we've had a bit of feedback from a couple of rooms um i'd like to compliment uh i think case in room 13 his hand is going to fall off and just after seeing a, a big long thing arriving in one of the things that arose i'm looking here at room five was the assessment of values and dispositions um, as, as a challenge, you know, and then there was, it rose across a number of different areas. Um, I just wonder, is that, has that been hard to do? Or you talk a lot about reflection, obviously assessing that and it's very yeah. much embedded in the programme. But do you want to comment on that? Yeah, and look, that is for any professional programme, that, that is the difficult one. How do you? Uh, and I think, it, you know, it, it, it presents itself in lots of ways. It, pre it presents itself in how prepared somebody is for their lesson. Um, so, you know, if I've gone to the trouble to have my resources, to have thought about the curriculum, have thought about the, the lesson plans that I'm planning, have thought about the individual children, that shows already, you know, a, a disposition to being a professional who's ready. We do, I mean, we talk to students even around how they present themselves in schools in, in terms of their own, their dress code, their, the way they are, are ready. We talk to them about, you know, being in school a half an hour before the day starts, being there half an hour being there is helpful you know and we get that kind of feedback cut, tends to come from the from the uh the, the, the school based um you know if somebody was turning up late or whatever you know principal might pick up the phone and say look i'm not really happy so we have a good relationship with um our partners our school partners as well insofar as we get some feedback on those those things that aren't as obvious when when it comes to a, a visit and that's why it's important I think while the you know we don't ask them to assess them we always have that conversation how are they getting on how are they and and that's in that conversation is where you will hear an awful lot of those kind of values dispositions how, how prepared the student is um, and we do mark the planning preparation and professionalism and we give that a mark on the form and we give that a comment on the form so we, we make it clear to students that that we have expectations around the standards and the way that they um interact in schools and interact with staff and um, you know so we do a lot of work on them i suppose we're lucky and maybe fortunate in that it's a postgraduate program so you know we are dealing with people who really want this qualification because they want to be teaching. So if, if that can be, um, but we're very open, I think, with students around that those pieces. And I think, you know, from the beginning, um, we expect, you know, those kind of standards to be met um, so that they know that. 
Mary, thank you very, very much for, for yeah, taking all those questions. Uh, yeah. Thanks to all the tables for feedback, but particularly thanks to Mary for her presentation and for taking the questions. And I'm going to hand back now to the MC because I know we're heading into module number four of today. So over to you, Peter. Thank, thanks very much, uh, David. And, and thank you, Mary, for, for a lovely presentation uh, that was packed with the uh, practical insights. Um, we began the day with uh, three presentations, uh, giving perspectives of the employer, professional recognition body and provider. And you might have been wondering why we missed out on the learner perspective. But we now have a presentation from Megan O'Connor. Uh, Megan is the education officer uh, for the Trinity College uh, Student Union. Um, and she's been participating at the event today and it's going to provide us with some reflections uh, on the day and a summing up from a student perspective. Over to you, Megan. Thank you very much. I hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, my name is Megan O'Connor. Um, as um, was just said, I'm a general nursing uh, graduate from Trinity College Dublin. I just finished up my four year degree program there a mere few weeks ago, and I'm currently serving as a TCDSU education officer. Um, I have to say I have thoroughly enjoyed today. It's absolutely fantastic to see all of the work that has been done and it is so encouraging. And I wish every single student involved in work placement um, could come along and see all of the work that's been done. It's so encouraging and positive. And I just have to commend everyone for the work that's been done. It's absolutely fantastic. And it is really, um, everything's moving in, in the right direction and it's fantastic to see. So a little bit about me. Um, I am from Clarny County Kerry. I moved to Dublin to pursue a career in general nursing. It's what I always wanted to do. Um, I bounced around from hospital to hospital over the last four years. I participated in the Erasmus programme and an awful lot of it was incredibly daunting. Um, but it made me the person that I am today. Um, I found new hobbies and everything else. And you may ask, why does this matter? It's because of this program I'm sitting before you today. And it's because of where I came from that I was the student that I was. Um, and this, this has an impact on everything and each student is an individual. And there needs to be room for flexibility in the programs that are run. And it, there needs to be a consideration um, for, for students as learners and individuals, as opposed to just names and numbers. So I hope this presentation will work. Oh, there we go. So work-based assessments, placements and internships are an absolutely integral part of higher education for many students. Like, as we mentioned on a number of occasions so far today, um, it's exactly what you want to do. It's really, really exciting going out on placements and internships because you finally get that opportunity to apply your, your knowledge to practice. Um, it's terrifying, I can attest to that, um, but it's brilliant and there are so many learning opportunities available. But work-based assessment has to be continually monitored and enhanced. Um, it will offer better learning opportunities for students. What it will do is it will ensure that the learning outcomes are accurate because the assessment should reflect that. Um, proper transparency and student representation in the review and the ongoing review of work-based assessment will not only improve the student experience, but I truly believe it will ultimately lead to a better and more holistic higher education system because students are the ones that are dealing and um, being part of this every single day on a day-to-day -day basis. So who are the stakeholders? Again, it's something that we discuss so often, and it's everyone. It is absolutely everyone. The majority of students who go out on placements are working in public service. So yes, higher education institutes, professional bodies, students and governments play part of it, but so do the public. It is impacting every single person. Professional guidelines are in place to protect the public as much as they are students, but students feel completely removed from these discussions and decisions that directly impact them and their futures. An awful lot of students don't engage with these guidelines and don't understand the importance of them to their practice. And that is something that needs to be addressed. And I think it can be through better transparency and communication and empowering students um, to understand why they need to um, why they need to abide by these guidelines. Learning outcomes, again, are without doubt one of the most important parts of a student's education. And they do need to be clearly communicated and relevant. They need to be updated. Students need to understand the rationale behind the learning outcomes and recognise the application of theory to practice. So it's well and good knowing that you need to do something, but why do you need to do it? You need to critically think these are professionals um, that will be out and independent before, before we all know it. Um, and they won't always have 
supervision their students need to understand the rationale of their learning outcomes and there's no point in applying learning outcomes across the board they have to be specific and they have to be flexible they need to be in line with good quality practices and need to be regularly updated and these empowered students that have all of this knowledge will thrive and they will do better and they will be better they should be included in the conversations and their learning outcomes because there's constantly new ways of thinking and emerging research and who better to propose new ideas than those that are new to a department or a system there needs to be a focus on moving away from hours and more towards learning outcomes and achievements an awful lot of professional regulatory guidelines i've read many of them they focus on hours or weeks and that's what's valued by students there is absolutely no point in a student sitting in a corner of a placement where they don't feel valued and they're not participating or contributing to it but that is the means of um their placement it's a tick the box it's a tick the box that we've all referenced at some point today we need to move towards better learning outcomes and achievements and ensuring that students have that good understanding. Micro-credentialing as well it wasn't originally included in my slideshow, but it's something that was mentioned today and I thought it was incredibly interesting. Apologies. Um, I thought it was incredibly interesting because um, in professional um, bodies, an awful lot of the time micro-credentialing isn't available. And that, that's understandable because students are pursuing um, one particular um, strain, but also it would be absolutely incredible to ensure, as was mentioned previously, that students could actually look into the areas that they are more interested in. And if we could adapt that and ensure that students could, could shadow preceptorships and everything, it would be absolutely fantastic. Assignment of tasks, scope of practice and defined by the professional bodies is often not very true to practice. There are common reports that students and the tasks allocated to them are trivial and outside of their scope of practice. Learning outcomes again, we're coming back to the same thing if they're precise and that area of practice is informed and reinforced at every opportunity. Um, the prioritization of learning and skills will be um, much better and not just based on the completion of tasks. In relation to assessment, continuity and authenticity is absolutely imperative. And there was something noted by a previous speaker that I found very interesting. It was if employability is dynamic and adaptive and work certainly is how can assessment emulate this and i think that's something that i'll be sticking up on my wall um over the coming weeks and we'll be looking at because it's it's absolutely bang on um if students are understanding and value um the active part in this assessment methods where appropriate along with the facilitators because there's no point in um we we going full steam ahead but the facilitators can't um ensure that they're able to hold through to these assessments and in an awful lot of placements um these are professionals, first and foremost, that are um, assisting students and facilitating students in those placements. And we need to be cognizant of the fact that they may be very tight in time and we have short staffing levels um, and it needs to be appropriate for, for them also. We need to encourage critical thinking and integration of knowledge and move away again from taking the box. Integration and collaboration between universities and practice is imperative in ensuring the accurate application of theory to practice. Assessments are terrifying it's often a snapshot you could be working with a person that is assessing you for the very first time that day there is an, an urgent requirement for more flexibility in alternative assessment methods um, and i do think COVID has op offered us a very unique opportunity to step back and reassess how we are assessing um, students and feedback and reflection as what was noted um, by a previous speaker um, it was absolutely fantastic about the feedback and reflection um, and that there's such an emphasis put on that because feedback is well and good but if you can't get um, a greater understanding of why you didn't do so well then you can't you can't improve and if you equip students um, with the knowledge of how they can do better they will and it's something that I think is actually very easily achieved and I think through collaboration and communication um, that is possibly one of the biggest things I've taken from today um, and it's it's absolutely imperative communication again transparency in the work that's being done um, I'll be telling everyone about this <laughs> and clear points of contact for students to address or report issues this is unfortunately something that's not quite as light a topic and um, there are a lot of lines and reporting procedures in place in professional accreditation courses as they should be but if a student has an issue or um, you know or just any kind of issue with an individual that's they're meant to be reporting their issues to where do they go then? Um, 
it's it's a difficult one and then that's where we see the gaps between the institutions um, and practice and it's who is really governing these students when they're out on placement and who is to be held accountable um, and who is to care for them and look after them when they need it um, and that is something that needs more work there needs to be clear responsibility sharing between HEIs, professional bodies and placement providers um, and partnering with students in the designs of this assessment students or workers it is a conversation i'm sure that everyone is aware of at the minute it's all over social media um, and again it ties into the the fear of students being exploited for their work and that they are there just to fill a role that they will be carrying out medial tasks and not focusing on their learning and there needs to be a clear distinction there is um, continually changing scopes of practice but they need to be clear and I think if a student could go into a placement every week with a goal for the end of the week, and many do, but if there was more of an emphasis on that um, and the reinforcement of those learning outcomes, I think that would in itself clearly distinguish between um, students and workers. Barriers for students, something that we all need to be cognizant of, it might necessarily be relevant to all conversations, but it, but it impacts them and it impacts assessment and learning outcomes. There are long systemic barriers to students which have an impact on their ability to engage in placements and achieving their learning outcomes. And we need to be cognizant of the fact that a student might have a bad day or a student might have a bad week. That student might not be able to afford the travel to their placements uh, due to socioeconomic difficulties. They might have learning disabilities that is um, Im impeding their ability to access the information that they need and they might not have those learning supports in placements. It does happen where students can be very, very supported within the college, but unfortunately that doesn't always carry through and through no fault of anyone's. Um, women in STEM, there is a long existing gender bias there that we're all aware of um, and men in caring roles as well. So culture needs to change and it's, it's no easy task, um, but it can be, it can be done and um, one step at a time. Survey findings, just to touch on them. Um, I know myself, my background is in nursing, so I'm more familiar with these statistics. Um, but the striking one was is the one over there to the right hand side in 2015. Over half of all student nurses and mid, or student midwives apologies in Trinity in a survey in 2015 felt victimised or bullied while in their work placements in maternity hospitals. Over three quarters of them believed that they were given responsibilities above their training or expertise, while two thirds of them found that their degree programme was harmfully affecting their mental health and considered dropping out in their course. Now, that is a absolutely shocking statistic and I, it is being addressed. It's being addressed every day and people are trying to do that. But again, we see the, the breakdown between placements and higher education institutes and who's really responsible for that and who is the person that has to address that. So these students not only fall between um, placements in the college, they also fall between two entirely different departments in government. Um, so the Department of Health that's meant to be looking after them is the Department of Higher Education uh, that's been newly founded. We don't know. Um, also the INMO survey um, said that 71% are considering leaving Ireland and we're talking about employability and ensuring that students are engaging um, in their workplace. And if we foster good workplace environments, it serves to benefit everyone. Um, and hopefully we'll have more students staying as we continue. Um, how do we bridge that gap? Collaboration at local and national level. It's just important. There's no point in um, addressing one without the other. If we empower students with this knowledge, um, they will they will be able to um, do that. And addressing issues when they arise. Science and issues contributes to harmful workplaces um, and is not conducive with a vulnerable learning environment. Everyone is human. Everyone makes mistakes um, and they shouldn't be the be all and end all. Um, and if we ensure that we foster an environment where everyone is confident and comfortable with raising questions and disclosing information where there may be mistakes, we will contribute to a much better and safer learning environment for students. The COVID implications. I mean, we. I mean, students on placements have just had an incredibly difficult time, and I really feel for anyone um, that may be trying to facilitate those placements. Um, I know I've seen it firsthand how difficult it has been but students in schools have been incredibly resilient and this has shown um, the, the caliber of individuals I guess we're dealing with on all on all scales um, but two major things that shown up was the over reliance on casual placements there needs to be clear agreements made um, with with placements um, and that 
they can't just cancel them because then what happens is the schools are left scrambling to find um, placements for students so they can um, abide by the guidelines. Um, it's really, as I mentioned before, a unique opportunity to reevaluate how we think of and treat workplace learning. What now? Collaboration, communication, consideration. It is absolutely essential that we commit to continue to improve and show the work that's been done already. Um, today alone, we have so much um, advice and research, um, and it's absolutely incredible. I mean, the, the topics that I've touched on are by no means exhaustive, but um, good work environments encourage encourage better better work and better together. And um, I hope I have I've touched on things enough. This is certainly a pit stop tour. I think I could talk about this topic forever. Um, but yeah, thank you so much to everyone for um, your time. And that's all for me. Thank you very much, uh, Megan. That was uh, superb. I think we could we could we could listen to you for for hours on end. Uh, th those insights are really really uh, fantastic, and uh, I mean it just underlines the the importance I think of all of us involved in this business, whether we be regulators, providers, uh, employers, actively engaging with uh, students. Um, on on the issues uh, because they have a huge amount uh, to offer unsurprisingly uh, two presentations now uh, one from uh, Terry McGuire Terry is the um, director of the National Forum um, for the Enhancement of Teaching and Learning um, and uh, she'll be talking about uh, next steps um, uh, from the forum's perspective, and I'll have a, uh, something to say on next steps from Q QQI's perspective uh, after Terry. Uh, over to you, Terry. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Peter, and, and hello to everybody. Um, it's been a very interesting day, and I have to say that um, I'm very pleased uh, that uh, QQI and the National Forum has partnered to actually start this national conversation. You know, as Megan said, we, we are stronger, we're, we're smarter together. And when we talk about the complexity and try and find solutions together, I think that's the, that's the best way forward. And um, one of the things that uh, we did at the end of our second webinar was we uh, spoke uh, with those there and we said, would they be interested in setting up and in involving in a community space around, around this particular topic? And I'm delighted that we got 10 volunteers uh, that we're now going to work with over the, the next week or so to set up a series of themed conversations through the community space. Um, that will uh, hopefully keep the conversation moving. Um, the second thing that, and, and just to say that I will make sure that all of the participants here will be invited and, and informed about how to join the community space if you're not already members. But remember, it's a community space for discussion. So that means that you have to check in, you have to respond and uh, to actually make it work. And we'll, we'll try and make it work together because I think we really need uh, to keep this conversation going. The second part, and uh, earlier this morning, you'll have heard from um, uh, the National Forum Teaching Fellow, Jer O'Neill, and Jer's work um, that she'll be uh, doing over the next 12 months is focused on work-based assessment. And I think the work that she's doing is really going to help, again, move on some of the issues that have been raised today and indeed raised over the, the two previous webinars. So rather than me talk about Jur's work, I thought I'd just get Jur in to give a brief summary about uh, the research she's been doing and, and uh, maybe perhaps to encourage everybody to support it and, 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 and to support her for the next 12 months. Jer, can I hold, hand over to you? Sure, yeah, thanks very much, Terry. <clears throat> uh, yes, I'm delighted to be able to, to talk again about uh, work-based assessment. Um, I wanted to fill you in on the research that I'm going to do um, because this is around the area of work-based assessment. and, I, and in June there, uh, I got the recent uh, teaching fellowship, National Forum Teaching and Learning Fellowship. And I decided at that point that I was always very interested in this area of work-based assessment. But I thought in looking at this research that 
I didn't want to launch into it initially and think, well, I have ideas I wanted to. And I wanted to find out what were the issues that the sector had. So my research question is around exploring barriers and solutions, which I'll come to in a minute, to an emerging assessment challenge. Um, so the challenge that has emerged <laughs> over the last uh, few months since I, I got the fellowship in, in June, um, I've learned a lot from these webinars. I've learned listening to you and listening to the chats and the conversations about what is a challenge for, for many of you across the sector. So I've learned that. And many of these, as, we, as I noted earlier, were around developing meaningful um, or authentic languages interchangeable, but also comparable and consistent assessments. Um, and when I looked at the literature on this, authentic assessment and meaningful was particularly coming through. Um, and we're also learning quite a bit from the ISI data from the student voice around what they're saying with, with sort of five years of ISI data. So that's the student um, engagement survey that, that happens annually. So my question that has emerged from, from all of you <laughs> and from the literature is how do we optimize both meaningful and comparable work-based assessments? So balancing authenticity and consistency across different work integrated learning contexts. So that is my question going forward. Um, and what I mean by context is, uh, I'm looking at it more broadly uh, we, Nora talked about all the different types of contexts today, but for the research, I want to particularly look at context A, which is the types of work integrated learning that happens on campus. So being inclusive of these types of modules that encourage case based projects, problem based learning projects with industry partners and many of you talked about um, experiences that fall into that space, important with, with um, sort of alternative types of placements. The middle um, section B is placements such as things like internships, work placements, cooperatives, where the key educator is actually probably the institution or the educator primarily. And then finally, onto the right hand side of, of this um, kind of slide, is context C, which is things like clinical placements, teacher education, probably in the space as well that we've heard, possibly apprenticeships, where the practitioner employer has more of a say. And then when you look up the other axis, is the level of student empowerment. So Megan, you'll be pleased to know that I'm really looking at how much students are empowered in, in these contexts. So taking these as the context broadly, what my research wants to do uh, is look at the challenge between balancing consistency and authenticity. It's not a binary balance. It doesn't mean that you're either one or the other. Um, that's why I liked this particular image with sort of a complicated balance because it is complicated. But how do we look at um, meaningful assessment, empowering students, complex learning, practitioner assessment, some of the things that, that Rola talked about today and in fact, Megan talked about herself. Um, and then you look at things that are, well, how do we stand over it? And how does this institution be consistent? How do we look at standards and quality? And how does the educator stand over it? And how do we get the balance between these in the different contexts? So very briefly, because I know you're probably tired of the stage, but what the, the research will do is first to look at it quite conceptually. So I'm going to interview some researchers, key researchers about what their understanding of this balance is. And then I'll also come in with them again as a focus group at the end. And um, so I will be looking at it quite conceptually and scholarly. But the bit that many of you might be interested in is how, what are some solutions? I want to use a real participatory research approach to this. I want the research to be useful, not just done on to. So I want to work with groups to look at some solutions as a group to the challenge of optimizing both meaningful and comparable work-based assessments. So balancing this authenticity and consistency. So I want to carry out some solution-focused groups, online workshops, um, and I want to do them across these three different contexts. So the idea is that I would work with maybe three groups across these three different contexts to work through some solutions 
in these online workshops. And each group would have students, practitioners, and either higher or further education staff and others that, that, that people have mentioned. Um, and that will be happening between January and August. So I really want to, to develop some solutions with you as a sector. Um, so what I would say is that it is going through ethics at the moment. So I have to get it stamped at the moment. But shortly um, when I have that, I will be looking for um, people to, to maybe volunteer or to be part of these kind of um, groups, these solution focus groups for in your different disciplines. So if people are interested, um, there's my email there and you can contact me. And once it's up and running between January and August, I would be interested in working with groups in an online workshop to develop some solutions. And obviously each group will have the solutions to their own and then they can work with them. Um, but obviously I will also share the common collaborative um, learning from this back with you. So that's the research, but I think it should be valuable to the sector. Um, and in December 2021, uh, we'll hear back about the whole, the whole research. So that's the research. Might hand back to you, Terry. Thank you very much, Ger. And I'd encourage all of you to, to uh, participate if you can. I think it's very important uh, research for the sector. Um, Peter, I'll hand back to you now. Hey, thanks very much, Terry. And, and thanks, uh, Geraldine. Um, I'd, uh, first of all, I'd like to say that uh, uh, that research that, that Geraldine has just sketched there looks really interesting. Um, and I'd like to echo what, what uh, Terry said a few moments ago in her, in her presentation, uh, and that is that you know, QQI and the forum have complementary roles and work really well together. And, and I look forward to our continuing uh, collaboration in, in various projects. Um, I'm going to say a little bit about what QQI, you know, the QQI's next steps and um, uh, not just directly in um, in matters related, directly related to uh, work integrated learning or assessment in the workplace, but, uh, but, but, but a little bit more broadly than that. Um, so the first thing I'd say is, you know, QQI is a quality assurance agency and it's a qualifications authority as well. And assessment is critical to both the quality of uh, education and the credibility of qualifications. So it'll be no surprise that QQI has a very keen interest in the quality of assessment of learning uh, in, in all its um, manifestations. And I, we also recognize there's a growing interest uh, in work integrated uh, learning and in work integrated teaching, learning and assessment. Um, consider, for example, the, the attention being given in recent, uh, by recent governments to apprenticeship and traineeships. Um, and this is, this, I think this is, this is here to stay. And, and indeed the COVID-19 unemployment crisis may, may well see an acceleration in, in, in that. Um, Assessment is beyond doubt, I think, uh, for, you know, at least from today's presentations, a, a critical success factor for work integrated learning. Um, not just in itself, but because in order to do assessment right, uh, it's got to be aligned with high quality teaching and learning and clear standards or educational goals. Um, and as the speakers have demonstrated, there are multiple kinds of work integrated learning and we're interested in them all. So we're interested in apprenticeship, we're interested in a traineeship, whether it be in FE or HE, we're interested in professional placement, um, but we're also interested in um, students getting work ex generic work experience that isn't necessarily uh, designed to give them occupation-oriented formation. Reflecting on today's events and, and the webinars that, that preceded it, uh, among the issues that, that struck me, um, and they're not uh, independent, are uh, dealing with variability. Um, th things vary uh, as you move from one setting to another, 
Um, the learning opportunities uh, may be different in one placement to another. The support available for learning will be different from one place to another. Assessment approaches will be different from one place to another. That's just a fact. Um, and we, we have to figure out how to deal with that. Um, uh, number two, um, building communities of practice uh, seems to be a really important part of, 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 of all of this. Engaging the key actors and that they would include employers, they would include education and training providers, they would include people that represent the interests of the occupations or professions or regulators, uh, and not least they include learners. All of those actors in sharing ideas and in coming together to reach shared understandings and, 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 and so on in relation to work integrated teaching, learning and assessment. Three, um, articulating and communicating professional or occupational uh, competence standards, or uh, more generally, uh, what exactly you expect somebody to learn in the workplace. Uh, and we've heard a number of speakers talk about the importance of being clear about, about educational goals. Um, I think uh, supporting employers is important. And, uh, and for example, through staff development, to enable them to, to engage in, 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 in the issues associated with uh, work integrated teaching, learning and assessment. I think there's probably something uh, to be done on agreeing principles, um, you know, perhaps key definitions and so on and so forth to, to enable us to, to talk about some of these issues in, 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 a, in a more meaningful way. Um, uh, so uh, with, with all that in mind, QQI is certainly going to continue uh, to engage with institutions, uh, employers, professional recognition bodies, learners, and other key stakeholders on the emerging issues uh, relating to work-based uh, assessment uh, in the greater context of work-integrated uh, learning. Uh, to build on the, on the uh, work of this year, to identify what actions we might need to take uh, if, uh, be beyond what we are already doing, um, and uh, we we, ex we value the, our, our our collaboration with the with the, with the forum in that regard. I'd like to outline some of the things that we are already doing that that, that have a relevance uh, here. Um, as Geraldine mentioned earlier on, we published a green paper on assessment in 2018. This identified a range of uh, issues for consideration, for discussion, for reflection, um, things that, that might warrant action by institutions, things that might warrant action by, uh, by other stakeholders, including QQI itself. And we're continuing to follow up on that, on that paper. Um, one of the things that I think is kind of obvious, but no harm to, to, to remind people of, is that QQI has long uh, been an active promoter of the use of standards based on intended learning outcomes in teaching, learning, and assessment. And we've heard a number of references uh, to, to, to learning outcomes today. Um, when we speak about assessment of learning, we mean um, quite precisely inference of a learner's knowledge, skill, or competence by comparison with a standard based on evidence. And QQI and its uh, predecessors have long uh, promoted the use of explicit standards based on knowledge, skill, and competence. Uh, and indeed, we, we have a role in, in um, maintaining the framework of qualification, which sets out the kind of generalized expectations for academic or educational qualification standards. Um, and that um, framework continues to be maintained by QQI. And, uh, and incidentally, we're currently in the process of updating the referencing of that framework to the EQF and the Bologna framework. Academic integrity is, is another issue that was raised in the Green Paper in 2018. Uh, since that Green Paper, uh, QQI's governing legislation has been amended to provide it uh, with um, the power to prosecute uh, people who either assist learners to cheat, uh, advertise cheating services, or publish advertisements of cheating services. Uh, we've also engaged in a fairly extensive program of collaboration with stakeholders to help them understand uh, their responsibilities in, in this regard. And um, 
we established with the institution with higher education institutions a national academic integrity network um, in November 2019. This is up and running and, and actively uh, engaging on, on, on the issues. And uh, while this particular network is focused on higher education, we, we would hope to, to have something similar established for further education uh, before too long. Um, Q QQI has uh, had an ex fairly extensive program of engagement with professional, what we call or what we refer to as professional statutory regulatory bodies, or PR PSRBs for short. To date, it's been mainly focused on trying to improve the mutual understanding between higher education institutions and PSRBs. Um, we're currently, uh, we've currently got a paper out for consultation uh, entitled Towards Principles for Accreditation and Other Professional Engagements. And those principles aim to reduce the burden of accreditation on both the PSRBs and HEIs, but also um, uh, to um, improve the, the, the mutual understanding between, between the, the, the organizations. The principles are based on a set of principles that was developed by, um, jointly by Professions Australia and the Universities of Australia. And um, among other things, those, those principles address the alignment of professional academic standards, uh, professional and academic standards, and that's quite relevant, I think, to, to some of uh, the discussions today. Um, another topic that um, we've been um, engaged on recently, um, that's been, I suppose, highlighted to some extent by COVID-19 is the um, blended learning guidelines. Um, we've been running uh, a blended learning seminar series uh, focused on supporting QA practitioners. And the most recent event in that series was entitled Assessment in a Blended Learning Environment from the Humanities Perspective. Um, and given that uh, for the duration of COVID-19, um, uh, there'll be a lot more, and probably well into the future, I, I would imagine that we're going to see an awful lot more people involved in e-working. Um, the assessment of, uh, is online assessment and assessment in the context of um, uh, remote engagement in, in activities is, um, is, 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 is relevant and, and, and that brings it in, into, into contact with today's topic. Um, the final thing I'd like to mention in, in this uh, brief uh, uh, whistle-stop tour of, of what we're doing is a green paper on, on the qualification system. Um, qualif QQI, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier on, is a qualifications authority. It, it, it has oversight of the educational qualification system. Probably the most noteworthy uh, thing that uh, that we do is maintain the framework of qualifications, but there's more to it than that. And we've recently published a green paper on, on the qualification system that contains, I think, a lot that is of relevance to the enterprise education nexus that's you know, at the heart of a lot of what we were talking about today. Um, the green paper uh, has an associated technical paper and uh, they provide a, a framework for discussion about further in higher education qualifications, the qualification system, the standards that underpin those qualifications, the communities of practice that underpin those standards, and the learning pathways that lead to qualifications, occupations, lifelong learning, and so on. Uh, we, <clears throat> we launched that paper in a fairly soft way during the summer because of the distractions of the COVID-19 crisis, but we'd, we'd expect to act more actively engage in that um, next year. So, uh, you know, to cut a long story short, there's, there's lots going on uh, in, in, in QQI that, and we're, we're, we're keen to, to continue to talk to people and engage people and whatever we need to do, we will do to support um, work-based assessment. I'd like to conclude today's um, event by thanking um, all of our speakers and facilitators, all of whom were excellent. Um, Joanne, Kirsten, Anne-Marie, Claire, Nora, Michelle, 
Rola, Naomi, Mary, David, and Megan. I'd like to thank our colleagues from the National Forum for the Enhancement of Teaching and Learning, uh, particularly Terry and Geraldine, but all of their colleagues too that have uh, contributed to, to today um, to, 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 to making this event a success, making the technology work, uh, moving the slides along. We really value our collaborations with the National Forum. Um, and as I say, our roles complement each other and we, we look forward to continued fruitful collaborations. It's always been a pleasure to work with, with, uh, with Terry and Geraldine. I'd like to thank my colleagues, uh, Sue and Karina, and the QQI communications team, Gronia, Duncan and Alison, for, for all their work uh, in, in, in helping put this together. And finally, uh, I'd like to thank all of the participations, uh, all of the people uh, involved in um, uh, all of the institutions that, 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 that support people coming to today's event, uh, everybody that's connected in any way with the organization of, of, of today's event. Um, we really value your, your, your engagement. Um, and with that, uh, I'll bring today's event to a close. Uh, a video uh, of the proceedings will be available uh, online. Thanks.